He's on the International Advisory Board for the Process Studies and was leader of, phys uh, excuse me, editor of Physics and Speculative Philosophy with De Gruyter Press in 2016. Uh, news of his recent volume, Untying the Gordian Knot, Process, Reality, and Context, continues to spread. If you have interest, we have it for sale in the back. It's a really inspiring read. And he's the ideal moderator, I would say, for this session on physics and metaphysics. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Timothy Eastman. Morning. So I'm pleased to uh, introduce to each of these three uh, fine speakers who I see each as exemplars of helping us towards initiating a new natural philosophy for the 21st century that is so much needed. And I will then start with uh, Dr. Joseph Pettick, who is Chief Archivist and Associate Editor at the Whitehead Research Project. He received his doctorate in Religion and Process Studies from Claremont School of Theology in 2022. He's the Chief Archivist of the Whitehead Research Project and Associate Series Editor for the Critical Edition of Whitehead. He has co-edited three books on Whitehead, Rethinking Whitehead Symbolism, 2017, Whitehead at Harvard, 20, 1924 to 25, 2020, and the Harvard Lectures of Alfred North Whitehead, 1925 to 27, General Metaphysical Problems of Science in 2021. And he's author, author of Unearthing the Unknown Whitehead, 2022, well, I need to get that one. Uh, but I've just enjoyed each of these materials and look forward to the continuing Whitehead Research Project outputs. Uh, uh, and with that, let's welcome Dr. Joe Pettit. First, I should say that by sheer coincidence, I was hired by the Whitehead Research Project of the Center for Process Studies on February 1st, 2013. That means that I've been with the center just a little over 10 years. Uh, at the time, I never imagined I'd be with CPS this long, but I'm delighted that it's worked out that way. Yesterday was also Whitehead's 162nd birthday. He was born on February 15th, 1861. Now, since this panel is all about physics and metaphysics, I thought I'd take the opportunity to do something I've been interested in doing for a while now, which is to look at the prospect of undertaking a new analysis of the compositional history of the single most important book in process metaphysics ever written, Whitehead's Process and Reality. I say new analysis because we'd be standing on the shoulders of giants in the field of Whitehead studies, most notably Victor Lowe, who was Whitehead's student and biographer, and Lewis Ford, who was the founding editor of the Process Studies Journal. Both of these men did enormously important work on this topic between 40 and 60 years ago, and yet there are some new and upcoming resources that could make a real difference in building on this legacy. So my goal with this presentation is, I think, fairly modest. I want to provide a general overview of Lowe's and Ford's work on process and reality, identify a few shortcomings, describe some of the recent discoveries that may help us gain new insight into the book's composition, and then talk a bit about where we might go from here. What I'm aiming to provide then is a starting point for further work yet to be done rather than any real conclusions. Hopefully you'll all find it interesting nonetheless. The story of the first work done into process and reality's compositional history begins with Lowe, who wrote an article titled Whitehead's Gifford Lectures in 1969 the first effort by anyone to give an account of the writing of what would become Whitehead's most famous book. It was based largely on Whitehead's letters to his son, North, and to others. Whitehead was invited to give the Giffords in early 1927, in the middle of his third year teaching at Harvard. He accepted about a month later and told his friend Kemp Smith that the lectures would be titled The Concept of Organism. He then spent the summer of 1927 between his third and fourth year teaching at Harvard, working on his Giffords. And in a letter to his son dated August 22nd, about a month before his Harvard classes were to begin again, Whitehead said, I have written nearly half a book on metaphysics this summer. I, I've now got nearly nine and a half chapters finished out of her projected plan of 20 or 25 chapters. Importantly for what comes next, Lowe then wrote the following about this letter. It is hopeless, indeed a mistake, 
to ask just which chapters of the book are substantially the nine and a half chapters that Whitehead wrote in his intensive summer's work. Nor can we know what he tackled next. No manuscripts of the book or of the lectures at Edinburgh survived. It is certain that, that what now seems to us to be the most logical order of the contents of process and reality, or the best order in which to read them, would not, even if we could agree on these matters, reveal Whitehead's actual order of writing. If anyone has full notes of what Whitehead said in his Harvard lectures and seminaries in 1927 to 28, they may shed a little light on it. The next development into the work on process and reality's compositional history took place six years later in 1975, when indeed a set of lecture notes covering the 1927 to 28 academic year was discovered, the year leading up to Whitehead's delivery of his Gifford lectures in June 1928. Nonetheless, Lowe's October 1975 letter to Ford was decidedly negative about the prospect that these new notes would be any help. Here's some of what he said about it. The second and third lectures in the first term state eight of process and reality's categories of explanation. The rest of the categorical scheme isn't stated. Probably he had made a draft of it in the summer, but wanted to talk to his students instead of losing them with its formal presentation. The genesis of the philosophy isn't represented in his lectures, and in the absence of manuscripts and journals, the genesis of the book can't be discovered. So Lowe believed that Whitehead had made a draft of the categorical scheme in the summer and then simplified or truncated it for his students. The thing is, I don't believe that this explanation actually makes much sense. Consider that his Harvard lectures, Whitehead called these eight categories principles rather than categories, and that he presented them in a different order. The eight principles that he presented to his students would become categories 1, 2, 4, 19, 7, 8, 9, and 18. While Lowe's explanation is technically possible, I don't really see why Whitehead would not only truncate things so heavily for his students, but even present these principles in a different order than he would in the finished product. The simpler explanation is that he was presenting what he had. As a speculative aside, I'll point out that the second sentence of Whitehead's published categorical scheme is the following. The whole of the subsequent discussion in these lectures has the purpose of rendering this summary intelligible. This to me suggests that Whitehead may well have seen the categorical scheme chapter as a kind of outline which he was continually tweaking and expanding as the book itself was being written. I'm sure that the many people here who have written books can attest that an introduction which serves to summarize its contents is often the very last thing to be written or else the last thing to be altered. And indeed, Ford's reaction was much like my own. Accompanying Lowe's letter, we also have four pages of Ford's preliminary notes on the lectures titled, Possible Article, Whitehead's Philosophical Development, 1926 to 1929. In it, he writes, I'm skeptical that this represents only a partial list of Whitehead's principles. I suspect we can see a genetic development here. I agree with Ford about this. Ford then goes on to briefly sketch an idea for himself of analyzing the development of Whitehead's philosophy from six principles that had been listed in the notes of George Birch for the 1926 to 27 academic year to eight listed by Marvin for 1927 to 28 to the finished form of process and reality. As it turns out, Ford would indeed end up writing an article and a book on this topic. But before doing that, he would in 1977 publish an article entitled Whitehead's First Metaphysical Synthesis in which he dipped his toes into the kind of textual analysis upon which he was seeking to embark with process and reality. The article claimed in brief that three key passages in Whitehead's book Science in the Modern World would be demonstrated to be later insertions and that an analysis of these insertions reveals an interesting shift in his philosophy and its development, namely Whitehead's realization that time is atomic rather than continuous. Lowe was appalled by Ford's article, which he saw as utterly lacking in evidence and justification. In an article published the following year titled Ford's Discovery About Whitehead, Lowe wrote the following deeply sarcastic and scornful paragraph. Ford's article requires a preface. It would say, the reader must bear in mind that at the present time no documents are available to confirm or refute any part of the history here presented. <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, the manuscript or typescript from which Whitehead read out the lectures which constituted his first metaphysical synthesis is not extant, nor any transcript of what he said, nor substantial notes taken by a member of his audience. Of the book, there are, I believe, no manuscripts, typescripts, galley proofs, or page proofs. Also, to the best of my knowledge, there is no notebook of Whitehead's or a diary covering the period I deal with, nor have any letters turned up in which he tells how he is expanding lectures into the book 
If any of these materials were known to exist, I should, of course, have consulted them. <laughs> Lowe went on to spell out that Ford had presented these supposed three insertions as, quote, sheer fact, when such a thing could only ever be guesswork, and expressed his opinion that, quote, narratives that rest on e external evidence are the only kind that can be of lasting help in understanding Whitehead's deposition. Lowe's final dig on Ford is in the penultimate paragraph in the article when he says that, quote, Ford is too courageous. But Ford, as it turns out, was not much discouraged by Lowe's criticism. <laughs> he felt he had something and would not be put off it. That same year, in 1978, he published an article in Process Studies entitled Some Proposals Concerning the Composition of Process and Reality. It was 12 pages in total and constituted Ford's preliminary sketch of the order in which he believed process and reality had been composed, along with his methods and justification for undertaking such a task. Much of it has to do with det detecting insertions via internal contradictions in the text, and also what Ford called ghost references, that is, places in which the Macmillan edition referred to erroneous or non-existent sections. He also pointed to some external evidence in the notes of Birch and Marvin, though he characterized it as meager and disappointing. And then, in the middle, Ford wrote this paragraph just before laying out his preliminary outline of process and reality's composition. I mentioned these anomalies, ghost references, and examples of rearrangement not in order to justify some one definitive order of composition, but to indicate why I think the determination of that order is largely possible. It had been my intention in recent years to publish just such a study, but now I am persuaded this sort of analysis can best be pursued cooperatively. Thus, in this essay, I wish merely to propose a provisional outline of the stages in the composition of process and reality in the hopes that it might elicit alternate hypotheses, all of which need to be tested against each other. Specific suggestions as to insertions need to be scrutinized by minds more skeptical than mine, for while there may be some later insertions in the text, there need not be nearly as many as I want to imagine. This is an invitation for all those interested to contact me whether or not they have any specific contributions to make. It may be possible to establish an informal newsletter or summer workshop with the eventual aim of publishing our results. As it turned out, in the end, no one accepted Ford's invitation of a collaboration on his project. Ford himself said that it needed, quote, minds more skeptical than mine, but perhaps all the other scholars who had the necessary expertise agreed with Lowe that Ford was being too courageous or else they were simply too busy with their own philosophical projects. Regardless, six years later in 1984, or about 40 years ago now, Ford published his landmark book, The Emergence of Whitehead's Metaphysics, with no co-authors. In essence, it was an expansion of the articles Ford had published in the late 70s, which sought to trace the line of Whitehead's philosophical development, starting from the composition of science in the modern world and culminating in Ford's analysis of the compositional order of process and reality, including the contents of the nine and a half chapters that Whitehead had referenced to his son, North, in the summer of 1927. It should be no surprise that Ford's book drew a great deal of interest and contemporary reviews of the book showed much excitement. Some were wholly complimentary. One review by Forrest Wood Jr. calls it the most important textual analysis of Whitehead's writings ever done, and that after Ford's work, no interpretation of a passage in science in the modern world or in process and reality will be complete without noting the passage's relation to the stratum from which it comes. Others were more skeptical. John Lango's review, for example, presented a detailed rebuttal to Ford's assertion that a particular passage in process and reality is a later insertion. After laying out his argument, Lango wrote, this detailed examination of an example should well illustrate the enormous difficulty of the burden Ford has taken upon himself and the indeed provisional and partial character of his results. Moreover, his discussion of this example is particularly significant because he has made his reasoning here so explicit. More often, he merely reports his results without giving his reasoning or merely adumbrates his reasoning, leaving the reader to fill in the gaps. If Ford plans to publish a sequel, I would suggest that he devote an entire chapter to an explanation of his method of compositional analysis, as in the present book there are only a few pages, and that he make much more explicit the steps in reasoning using that method that lead him to the results he reports. In the end, we can safely characterize books, Ford's book Emergence as a highly important and yet deeply controversial book, one that scholars have continued to wrestle with even to the present day. For example, Paul Bogard wrote in his 2017 introduction to the first volume of Harvard Lectures that they seemed to disprove Ford's temporal atomism thesis, while Ronnie Desmet, in a book ch chapter published in 2020, argues the opposite. 
that Harvard, the Harvard lectures seemed to show that Ford's theory was correct. Now, I'm sure that I'm already getting low on time, but finally, with these preliminaries out of the way, I can talk a bit about some new developments and possible approaches to a project somewhat like Ford's. One thing that's changed in the ensuing years, which I want to stress, is that the first two volumes of Whitehead's Harvard lectures have been published, which cover Whitehead's first three years of teaching at Harvard, and they provide a far more robust picture of these lectures than either Lowe or Ford ever provided. In some cases, this was because they simply never saw sets of notes that we were later able to discover, including the notes of Winthrop Pickard Bell and Fritz Jules Rothesberger. In other cases, both Lowe and Ford had access to more complete sets of notes, yet underutilized them or did not utilize them at all, as was the case for the notes of George Perigo Conger and Sinclair Kirby Miller. I can only guess as to why these resources were not better employed at the time, but it may partly have to do with accessibility and legibility. The notes of Birch and Marvin that both Lowe and Ford seemed to lean on the most heavily in their analyses had been typed up by the original note takers. The notes of Conger and Kirby Miller were handwritten in full of obscure shorthand, not to mention that I suspect that at times Ford and Lowe were trying to work with nearly illegible photocopies. 1970s Xerox machines did not always provide the best quality. Regardless, having edited the second volume of Whitehead's Harvard Lectures myself, I find Ford's reliance on Birch's notes for his analyses to be somewhat appalling. Ford characterizes these in his emergence as, quote, a very good set of student notes for the 1926 to 27 academic year. In my view, these are one of the absolute worst sets of notes that we have. Birch usually did not record more than about 150 words per lecture and skipped a great many altogether. Conger, by contrast, routine, re routinely recorded over 1,000 words per lecture. Also, we have more than 300 pages of notes from Conger and only 14 from Birch. Here is how Birch's notes were characterized in our introduction to HL2, published in 2021. The first 11 pages are not dated at all and have some headings which turn out on closer inspection to be misleading. For instance, the first two pages are titled Lectures by Professor Whitehead, Introduction, which one would think was Whitehead's first lecture of the term, but in fact, these first two pages contain material from three lectures, the first, third, and fourth of the term. Without other notes to compare them to, one would never know that Birch had summarized the content from three non-consecutive lectures together. We never use Birch's notes as our primary account. They are simply too brief to be of much use. Suffice to say that we now have a much better picture of Whitehead's Harvard lectures than we've ever had before which is already giving us some real insights into his philosophical development that we never could have guessed before now. One example that relates specifically to process and reality is the influence of C.D. Broad, who Whitehead only mentioned once in his books in a footnote to the principle of relativity, and yet whose books we now know were assigned reading for Whitehead's students for at least the first seven years of his Harvard tenure. In fact, that Whitehead ended up framing process and reality as, quote, an essay in speculative philosophy may be attributed partially to Broad, who in the mid-1920s made much of a distinction between what he called critical philosophy versus speculative philosophy, a distinction which Whitehead made a point of discussing in some detail with his students. However, it's true that I'm jumping the gun a little when it comes to the prospect of possibly undertaking a new analysis of process and reality's compositional history. What we need now is for the third volume of Harvard Lectures to be published, as it will include notes for the academic years directly before and directly after Whitehead's delivery of his Giffords in June 1928. It will again include, no include notes which Lowe and Ford either never knew about or vastly underutilized, and I have little doubt that it will turn out to be the most important single tool at our disposal for doing the kind of analysis Ford was attempting. This is not to mention that technology has also made our job much easier than it was 40 years ago. The power and ease of word processing software and keyword searching is not to be underestimated. But the real question here at the end is whether a compositional analysis of process and reality similar to the one Ford did is even a viable and worthwhile thing to attempt. Lowe didn't think so. Neither did Ivor Leclerc and a lot of other process scholars who were worried about reading more into the text than was actually there and insisted on relying solely on external evidence. Ford, by contrast, was, to use Lowe's phrase, almost certainly too courageous. In a 1981 review of the corrected edition of Process and Reality, he even discussed the possibility of a revised edition, a radical reconstruction that would adopt Whitehead's final terminological usage, for instance, as the preferred one. Ford admitted that this was not yet feasible and bound to be controversial, and yet almost no one today, I suspect, myself included, would think this was a good idea. <laughs> 
My belief is that the best answer to this question of a new compositional analysis of process and reality, as is so often the case, lies somewhere between these two extreme points of view. Ford's problem, which he himself admitted, was, was that he needed, quote, minds more skeptical than mine to keep him from taking things too far, which was something he never really got. George R. Lucas, Jr., who, was working with, who has worked with Brian Henning and I in the critical edition, wrote a lot about Ford's work in the 80s and characterized it this way. The major defect of Ford's project is the highly conjectural nature of the conclusions drawn from it in the absence of any corroborative primary source documents, coupled with the tendentious and decisive manner with which highly speculative con conclusions are frequently presented. Indeed, in reading Ford's emergence, he often refers to the, quote, Giffords draft as if it were a physical document in his possession rather than merely an imaginative reconstruction. No wonder the whole thing ended up being so controversial. Lowe, meanwhile, was not courageous enough. For as much trouble as Ford arguably got himself into by not adequately justifying his conclusions, there is nothing wrong with making the attempt as long as one is appropriately ruthless in rooting out anything even remotely speculative, or at least labeling speculation appropriately. Because there are, in fact, a lot of things that Ford pointed out in his analysis that really aren't controversial, or at least shouldn't be. I'll give one easy example, which unfortunately is all I have time for. I'll wager that there are people here who don't know or don't remember that Whitehead laid out a category of reversion in his categorical scheme on page 26 of the corrected edition, and then later on, on page 250, explicitly abolished that category. This is literally Whitehead contradicting himself in his own text. Hence, there can be no controversy over the fact that this portion of the categorical scheme was written before the later section in which it was abolished, and that Whitehead simply could not be bothered to comb through his manuscript and remove any references to a concept that became irrelevant in the process of his writing the book. So what we need, I think, is a new book that provides a definitive list of such inconsistencies without resorting to the kind of undue speculation that Ford was prone to do. His emergence has proved over the last four decades to be an enormous stimulus, but it is fatally flawed. He was too courageous and not skeptical enough. What is needed is a book that is as uncontroversial as possible, which scholars can reference with confidence. As I've already said, the time to do this would be in the wake of the publication of the third volume of Harvard Lectures, as this will provide the easiest access to the best possible external evidence that we are ever likely to have for such an endeavor. You may consider this presentation of mine to also be an invitation to potential collaborators, just like the one Ford made in 1978. We've still got some years ahead of us before HL3 is even published to think on it, but I believe it would, will, it would be a worthwhile challenge to embark upon. Thank you. Boy, do I wish I was a fly in the wall and uh, Whitehead Harvard lectures at that time, and I almost get that sense when I read the wonderful uh, new materials they have uh, brought forward from the project. Thank you. Next, uh, Dr. Lisa Lando Hedry, the teaching fellow in the Divinity School and the College at the University of Chicago. Her current interest explores the relationship between Anglo-American theories of language, nature, and metaphysics. She is book review editor of the American Journal of Theology and Philosophy, the Journal of the Institute for American Religious and Philosophical Thought, and is the author of Whitehead and the Pittsburgh School, Preempting the Problem of Intentionality, 2021, a work, by the way, which I've read and enjoyed very much, and I recommend. Uh, Dr. Hedrick. So this paper is an attempt to revisit a question that I actually posed for myself in the epilogue to the work that uh, Timothy just referenced. Uh, it was a short epilogue that was, in a sense, saying that uh, this is not a call to conversion, right? Um, that Whitehead doesn't want you to believe him in the sense that he's given you the final picture of reality. So. The work today, the, the title, it's meant to be sort of provocative, right? Was Whitehead telling the truth, right? The alternative to that is not, was he lying? It's, 
in what sense was he telling the truth? What does it mean to do that, right? In what sense can we understand his uh, speculative philosophy as correct? Uh, clearly, I think that it is incredibly useful, right? But what sort of theory of truth uh, is he either implicitly or explicitly developing there, such that how would he defend the correctness, right, of his own system of thought? So by recursive analysis, then, I mean thinking with Whitehead about Whitehead. More specifically, I mean assessing in what way his metaphysics is correct or corrective, by his own measure. Did Whitehead understand himself to be telling the truth? If so, in what sense? This began as a paper about the world, right? So what it means to get reality or nature right. It became a paper about God, uh, and it resolved into a paper about neither. So Whitehead's metaphysical terminology lacked finality by his own admission. All systematic thought begins from presuppositions and depends upon some narrowness of selection among its notions. Philosophy's chief danger, as we all know he says, is narrowness of selection. And so its systematic thought can be successful only to the degree to which it avoids narrowness with respect to its ultimate notions. Such notions are serviceable to the achievement of philosophic truth to the extent that they capture presuppositions of language. So presuppositions of language and philosophical truth are Whitehead's terms. That means to say that they are not successful to the extent that they are clearly and distinctly corresponding to the facts. It's vagueness that can characterize depth of relevance. I will later refer to in his technical terminology as importance, formal importance. So the proper test of a system of ideas could never be finality, but only progress, so he says. But that progress is always asymptotic and therefore interminable. Asymptotic to what, right? Whitehead does not talk about progress in terms of approximating a better description of reality, but in terms of a more adequate and applicable interpretation of experience. Adequacy is a characteristic of the system. Philosophic truth will always be limited by what he calls unexpressed presuppositions, but that does not make the system wrong, only approximate or partial. But again, approximate in what sense? Abstraction is, quote, the universe in perspective, and perspectives are the, quote, dead abstractions of mere fact from the living importance of things felt. Here, perspective, I don't think should be understood in visualist terms. Whitehead is not talking about world views. It is more accurate, I think, to call perspectives worlds or actual worlds than world views in this context. Whitehead uses the term actual entity instead of sensible object precisely in order to free his notions, he says, quote, from participation in an epistemological theory as to sense perception. So we can only understand to the extent that we can abstract, but to abstract is to create perspective. So understanding is in principle only ever elliptical. The metaphor of the ellipse is no doubt lost on me in its full importance because I'm no mathematician as he was. But in my feeble effort to appreciate Whitehead's technical language, the following strikes me as illustrative. The movement of a circle within another circle, a larger circle, along the larger circle's circumference, if traced from the perspective of the center of the smaller circle, it creates an ellipse. We might imagine the smaller circle as the rational scheme of ideas, and the larger as representative of the communicable universe. The only one, he says mockingly in a footnote uh, about Kant, right, that he is concerned with. This is not a representation of reality, it is an illustration of the rationalist enterprise as I see him understanding it. It is not illustrative, therefore, of world views, but more like multiple worlds emoting the fundamental character of reality. 
It would be truer to say, if we were to use those terms, that it illustrates the reality of representation rather than the other way around. His non-representationalist assessment of his own scheme is evident in his response to positive critiques of metaphysics. Unfortunately for this sort of objection, he writes, quote, there are no brute self-contained matters of fact capable of being understood apart from interpretation as an element in a system. And that, quote, every scientific memoir of, in its record of the facts is shot through and through with interpretation. Vagueness or generality is valid to the extent that the process of its production entails strict adherence to what he calls the conditions for the success of imaginative construction. The proper method of generalization is what Whitehead calls rationalism, or the pursuit of rationalistic ideals, which he dubs coherence among primary notions and consistency among logical deductions. That there is a proper method by which generalization qua imaginative construction succeeds is of exceeding importance for appreciating Whitehead's positive account of constructivism as addressing, not creating, problems of mereness, which I'll come back to. Control generality gives us a new method of observation where what we are observing are the presuppositions of language that are otherwise obscured by their ubiquity. Languages are, quote, storehouses of human experience, he says, and exhibit a general character which cannot be noticed except when employed in a deliberate way. When Whitehead states that there are no self-contained facts, therefore, I understand him to be indicating how languages store experience, not, that is, by recording the facts, but by constructing a conceptual matrix. And this matrix is a technical term I'll also come back to. Okay, so meaning, therefore, can only exist in relations between terms, and its meaning also exhibits that relationality. So it is this statement that facts are not self-contained uh, facts, right, that cannot be self-contained by in principle is really both a statement about itself and the meaning of that statement can only uh, really be fully understood by means of what it refers to beyond itself. I'll explain that. Definition for Whitehead is always relational. As he explains its formal sense in the Principia, quote, a definition is a declaration that a certain newly introduced symbol or combination of symbols is to mean the same as a certain other combination of symbols of which the meaning is already known, end quote. A definition is always expressed as relation between what he says, what is defined and that to which it is defined as meaning, between definiendum and definiens. In process and reality, we see this point, <coughs> excuse me, in the idea that there are no self-contained facts because every proposition, qua proposal of a fact, is definable only in terms of its systematic context in the actual world. Now, this seems like a slide between logical propositions and propositions as ontological categories. It's precisely this shifting that we see in uh, Whitehead's work, particularly in Process and Reality, that it is really perplexing to me. By trying to connect the work in the Principia and the work in Process and Reality, it might seem unauth unauthorized because it sounds a bit like a category mistake. Wasn't his quarrel with Bertrand Russell all about logic not mirroring reality? Yes, but this is kind of precisely my point. Whitehead's metaphysics isn't claiming to mirror reality either. He is schematizing to get somewhere, to resolve, to render conceivable. So this is something that I want to uh, perhaps talk about in the comment section if possible. Um, why do we think it might be a category mistake to talk about the propositions in the Percipi and the nature of their relations among one, one another and those that he dubs as a category of existence in process and reality? <clears throat> 
Okay. The adequacy of expression of the final generalities of experience is the goal and not the beginning of metaphysics, precisely because determinateness implies a system, and that system is only refinable through a process of explication. Metaphysics, as I understand Whitehead to think, is the process of analyzing as accurately as possible verbal or written propositions in the pursuit of the most generic notions. These notions exhibit the texture of ontological propositions. The system thereby facilitates not a representation, but an appeal to the facts. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to slow down and really take him at his word for a lot of the technical choices he uses. Okay, so these notions, they are finally generic in the logical sense, I think, of being non-derivative and mutually implicative or definable in terms of each other and therefore logically simple. Trying to understand these, these generic notions in terms of what he says about primary ideas in the Principia. Generic notions only mean insofar as they function to contribute determination. So to function is defined uh, in process and reality as well as in the Principia as a con contribution of determination to other notions. It is a fundamental assumption of Whitehead's um, in the Principia that, quote, a function can only appear in a matrix through its values. This sounds like the logical version to me of the ontological principle, that a function is not recognizable apart from the actualities whose determinateness exhibit it. It is significant, then, that Whitehead makes explicit his understanding of his speculative scheme in process and reality as a matrix. He writes, the scheme is a matrix from which true propositions applicable to particular circumstances can be derived. The use of such a matrix is to argue from it boldly and with rigid logic. The truth function of a proposition is derivable from, because relative to, a system of ideas. But that system itself facilitates the appeal to the facts, not individual propositions. To call the scheme a matrix is therefore to deny that the philosophic truth achieved by the scheme is a matter of direct representation between its notions or propositions and things and facts. The utility of the scheme is realized only insofar as it approximates adequate self-expression. What the scheme enables is the expression of general truths whose status as such is lost when any one is taken as an adequate expression of the facts, that is, or ontic propositions. Linguistic expression of ontic propositions or ontological propositions never finally express them. Taking linguistic propositions to express metaphysical ones is a pragmatic self-contradiction. He writes, the true propositions which they do express lose their fundamental character as such as true when subjected to adequate expression in subject predicate form of statement, as I understand him to be indicating. Language is by its very nature indeterminate. It cannot enunciate well-defined propositions because each enunciation, each occurrence of language is conditioned, presupposing, he says, some systematic type of environment. It can only express those presuppos presuppositions and thereby produce perspectives. A perspective is only achieved by coherence and consistency. Its worth, what we might call its truth, is, is measured by how it facilitates the self-disclosure of experience. It is for this reason that Whitehead says it is not a valid criticism of a metaphysical system to show that, quote, its doctrines do not follow from the verbal expression of the facts accepted by a different system. The issue is only ever about the extent to which those doctrines, quote, supply a closer approach to fully expressed propositions. Adequate expression is not the same as adequate representation. What metaphysical statements try to express are the general ideas presupposed by facts of experience. 
And therefore, the measure of their adequacy is elucidation, not representation of that experience. General ideas are always exemplified, never observed. Strict induction, or what he says, or calls rigid empiricism, will never divulge them. Philosophic generalization, when partially successful, quote, will enlighten observation in remote fields of application so that general principles can be discerned in the process of illustration, which in the absence of an imaginative generalization are obscured by their persistent exemplifi exemplification. That was a quote from Whitehead. Philosophical truth is, it sounds to me, constructed. It is achieved in part by demanding the mutual implication of first principles, the ideal of coherence, and the avoidance of contradiction or logical consistency. The formal importance of a rational system in the sense of its pervasiveness grows in proportion to its formal elegance in the sense that <clears throat> Its primitive ideas and principles are, as Whitehead says, few and simple. But rational construction is, quote, productive of important knowledge, what he calls important knowledge, only insofar as more critical empiricism is thereby aided by it. The construction should disclose the character of reflective experience. Its capacity to do so is measured by the extent to which it resolves problems in our ability to conceive or in account for experience. The problem of principal concern for Whitehead was the problem of mereness that I mentioned earlier. Misplaced concreteness, for instance, is a problem because it makes real togetherness inconceivable. Inconceivability is a goal is the problem. Conceivability is a goal. He says, philosophical thought has made for itself difficulties by dealing exclusively in very abstract notions, such as those of mere awareness, mere private sensation, mere emotion, mere purpose, mere appearance, mere causation. These are the ghosts of the old faculties, banished from psychology, but still haunting metaphysics. There could be no mere togetherness of such abstraction. Mereness is therefore a technical term, signal, signaling uh, an inadequate set of primary notions. Mere notions are abstractions that have not been properly generalized. Whitehead replaces uh, these primary notions that he finds problematic with ones like actual entity, preemption, nexus in order precisely to preempt the problem of their togetherness. <clears throat> These primary notions are modeled on what Whitehead calls primitive ideas in the Principia. We understand their speculative function without appreciation of their formal function at, uh, for Whitehead as indefinables. Whitehead says in the Principia, their primitiveness is only relative to our exposition of logical connection and is not absolute. Though, of course, such an exposition gains in importance according to the simplicity of its primitive ideas. The primitive ideas in the Principia designate the fundamental functions of propositions. These fundamental functions are the contradictory function, disjunctive function, conjunctive function, and implicative function. What makes them important is that they serve as the basis for all deduction. All other propositions are subordinate ones. Primitive ideas are few and simple. They are also mutually implicative. If two of them are taken as primitive, undefined ideas, the other two can be defined in terms of them. Likewise, in process and reality, Whitehead says that the metaphysical first principles can never fail of exemplification, at least without, not without ceasing to be first principles. So it's not their independence but that makes them primitive, it's precisely their lack of independence, but their simplicity, their elegance. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to um, skip a little bit. This is beautiful, thank you. So the whole point for Whitehead in process and reality is to account for creative advance, right? For the advance from disjunction to conjunction, creating a novel entity uh, other than the entities in the initial disjunction. 
The possibility of novelty is the possibility of a novel togetherness of the disjunctive many that become one among the many. Whitehead terms the production of novel togetherness a concrescence, as we know, and designates it <clears throat> as an ultimate notion. But again, these ultimate notions are uh, ultimate only with respect, as we've just established, to the scheme it itself. Language is imprecise in principle. Language is thoroughly indeterminate, he says, by reason of the fact that every occurrence presupposes some systematic type of environment. Language functions qua imprecise because meaning is matrixial. But for the same reason, it can be generative of a new quality of perspective. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm, I'm skipping forward. Okay, so now, <clears throat> the mandate of philosophy, according to Whitehead, is to recover the totality obscured by selection, right? The service of its generic notions to consciousness is to make it easier to conceive the infinite variety of specific instances which rest unrealized in the womb of nature. The rational scheme produces a cosmological story the fullness of which is imminent no matter where one begins within it. To conceive by way of generic notions is to attempt to contract the communicable universe as systematically presupposed in reflective experience. I said that this paper became one about God. Unfortunately, I don't quite have the time to, to address that portion yet, but I will say briefly that the final interpretation right, of the scheme in terms of the God world contrast, gives us an excellent attempt or an excellent opportunity to understand the way in which Whitehead saw himself to be telling the truth. Because if we do not allow that, that contrast to finally dissolve itself, to disclose the nature which has no other, if we let it be a, a, a final set of oppositions, right, then we have completely missed his point. Right? which is to say that God, the God world contrast can be true, but not insofar as it's representative, right? but in terms of its, its function to dissolve itself, to render conceivable what he says is the infinite variety of possible experience resting in the womb of nature. So I'm going to conclude there um, and leave the rest to possible questions. That is quite a bit to reflect on, and I look forward to it. Uh, so I need to uh, bring this up a little bit so you can hear me. Okay. Uh, so next, uh, we have Dr. Matthew David Siegel, uh, assistant professor in the philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness program at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco. He's a transdisciplinary researcher focusing on applications of process philosophy across the natural and social sciences He's the author of Reemerging of Schelling, Philosophy in a Time of Emergency, uh, 2014, Physics of the World Soul, Whitehead, Whitehead's Adventure in Cosmology, 2021, and Crossing the Threshold, Etheric Imagination in the Post-Kantian Process Philosophy of Schelling and Whitehead. Boy, I look forward to that. That's forthcoming. Uh, he also blogs regularly at footnotes2plato.com. Dr. Siegel. Good morning, everyone. How's the sound? Good? Thank you, Tim, uh, Lisa, Joe. Um, very excited to present today a paper that I've titled Physics Within the Bounds of Feeling Alone. Um, I don't have time to read the whole paper, as, as Andrew knows quite well at this point, having invited me to submit uh, to a number of anthologies. I tend to uh, go on at length, um, so this paper is way too long to read, but let me summarize what I'm trying to do here. Those of, you who are, those of you who are students of German idealism may have uh, recognized my title as a, uh, a play on Immanuel Kant's uh, 
uh, title uh, of, a, of a text he wrote in 1793. Um, Religion within the bounds of reason alone is how it's often translated. Now, my subject in this paper is not religion, um, but you could say it is related to reason, though an attempt to um, bring reason back to its senses, bring a certain kind of scientific reasoning back to its senses. Now, whenever I engage with um, natural scientists, physicists or biologists uh, as a philosopher, and I'm trying to um, surface for them the metaphysical presuppositions of their own uh, interpretation of their science, I tend to immediately revert back to Kant. Not because I am uh, a defender of his transcendental idealism, but because I think it um, allows us to get off on a better start in trying to understand what natural science is really all about. Kant, as you'll remember, tried to, in his later critical phase, uh, develop a, an understanding of knowledge and the presuppositions of what it would mean to know. But in order to understand human understanding, he had to create this epistemological dualism between the phenomenal world and the world of things in themselves. Kant's question was, what must mind be like such that nature could appear to us as minds in the way that it does. So for Kant, rather than thinking of physical laws as something that scientists were discovering out there in the world, physical laws were really the way that our own understanding is, is uh, constructed and the way that it organizes our uh, sensory experience, right? So scientists aren't discovering laws in nature, they're uh, uncovering uh, certain modes of their own understanding, right? The, this kind of idealism is not satisfying to Whiteheadians, not, not satisfying to me, but I think it helps remind scientists tempted by a kind of materialism or physicalism that they, that they are making certain epistemological presuppositions, uh, for example, that they are um, conscious beings capable of thinking, feeling, and willing. They're conscious agents, in other words, who can uh, engage in uh, mathematical uh, reflection. And so to understand the universe as some kind of merely uh, material process, merely physical process, I don't think post-quantum theory that we can really refer to a mechanistic universe anymore, but nonetheless, there's a lot of holdover from that earlier uh, Newtonian and Cartesian, uh, really, metaphysics. But there's a sense in which physicalist scientists are trying to uh, describe a universe which could not ever give rise to the very conscious reasoning capacity that they're using to understand it. So Kant helps us see this, this problem very clearly, but he gives us a new problem. And so in order to overcome his idealistic split between a realm of phenomena and things in themselves, I turn to not only Whitehead, but also uh, Friedrich Schelling, who was a German idealist who thought in the wake of Kant and uh, tried to think in the spirit of Kant to overcome what he thought were some um, wrong turns in Kant's own philosophy. So in some of my earlier work that um, Tim was mentioning, I've tried to read Schelling as in the process lineage. Whitehead does cite Schelling once, but he's not, uh, I would say, conscious of inheriting a Schellingian philosophy of nature. But nonetheless, um, as I show in, in my paper, I think there are good reasons to think that he can be read as an inheritor of, of Schelling's organic approach to natural science. So what Schelling does with Kant is a kind of inversion, right? And if you're familiar with Whitehead's statements about inverting Kant, you'll recognize this. Rather than Kant's problematic, where he said, what must uh, mind be such that nature can appear to it in the way that it does, in the lawful way that it does, Schelling inverts this and says, what must nature be such that mind could emerge from it, right? Whitehead does a similar inversion, and rather than trying to start with a merely material world and understand how life or mind could somehow emerge out of it, 
Whitehead sees our own human consciousness, our own thinking, activity, feeling, willing, our direct experience of uh, practical action, the capacity to realize purposes, and says that's an exemplification of something that must be generic throughout the universe, right? So rather than uh, sidestepping or ignoring our own, the, the, the immediate deliverances of our own concrete experience and trying to somehow derive that from a model of the physical world as whatever it might be, um, a quantum waveform wave or a uh, space-time metric of some kind, uh, we begin with our own immediate experience and we metaphysically generalize. I'm grateful to go after Lisa who was explaining Whitehead's metaphysical um, method here of generalization. How can we generalize what we immediately experience to come up with metaphysical categories that would apply to actualities at every scale of nature, whether we're talking about uh, what particle physics studies or whether we're talking about what biologists study or what psychologists study. So in this paper, I enter into dialogue with a prominent physicist and physicalist, uh, Sean Carroll, who I've chosen because unlike many physicists, he's at least willing to acknowledge that philosophy has a very important role to play in natural scientific discourse. Most physicists would just dismiss philosophy as irrelevant. Carroll is at least willing to have this conversation, though he does think that physicalism is the most likely ontology, and he tries to, in some ways, um, engage in what Whitehead would call a brilliant feat of explaining away uh, by explaining how, again, all of our thinking, feeling, and willing can ultimately be explained as uh, the motion of atoms through space with you know, the requisite qualifications given what quantum physics has discovered about the nature of so-called atoms or particles. Carroll happens to be a proponent of the many worlds interpretation, so. Um, So, one of the ways that Schelling helps us overcome this Kantian split uh, is by criticizing Kant's treatment of sense perception in a way quite analogous to Whitehead's criticism of the so-called sensationalist um, principle, which is that our most primal form of experience, raw experience, from Kant's point of view, inheriting Hume's point of view, uh, comes to us just in the form of bare, unrelated uh, sensa or sensor universals that then the mind um, for Hume would be in the business of associating into more complex ideas. Um, and for Kant, the understanding would go to work on this, um, the givenness of sensibility to organize our uh, coherent experience of a world. Schelling says that um, Kant's account of Sensation is very much, uh, and, and feeling, kind of inner sense, is, is a, it's, he thinks it's a sense that still very much needs a critique despite Kant's treatment of it in the transcendental aesthetic, this part of his major work, the critique of pure reason. And Schelling only makes this statement that feeling still very much needs a critique late in his career in, in the 1840s, um, a decade or so before he passes. And Whitehead, again, not consciously, uh, but nonetheless, I think you can see the convergence of ideas here where Whitehead says in Process and Reality that he's endeavoring to undertake a uh, critique of pure feeling, right? And to put it in the place of Kant's critique of pure reason. And so feeling for, for Whitehead becomes really the, um, it's both a source of great misunderstanding uh, for people who come to Whitehead's thought uh, for the first time but it's also, I think, the, the keystone of, of his entire uh, metaphysics. The technical term, of course, here is prehension, uh, but he uses the term feeling, which has um, other connotations, I think, to connect with our own experience. Prehension for Whitehead is a generalization of what we normally call feelings, but the philosophical tradition 
Kant included, tended to think of feeling as something merely subjective. It's merely inside, and the facts don't care about your feelings, right? As is often said. Now, my response to this um, would be to ask that, you know, what if, what if feelings are among the facts? And Whitehead's concept of prehension allows us to understand what that might mean. Uh, and indeed, what if feeling is the only medium through which facts might come to matter? And so what I try to do in this paper is reconstruct physics using Whitehead's category of prehension. Whitehead did most of the work for me, obviously, but I think that he hasn't been properly understood. So I'm engaged in an effort, hopefully a diplomatic effort, um, to explain Whitehead and explain uh, myself as a philosopher to physicists, because this isn't just a matter of getting the physics right. It's not just a matter of getting the metaphysics right. I think that popular scientific accounts of the nature of the universe have um, psychological and, and, and spiritual effects on people. And if the common sense nowadays is that we live in a still basically mechanistic universe, if not mechanistic in the old Newtonian sense, then at least purposeless, uh, full of blind energetic activity that only accidentally gave rise to life and only accidentally gave rise to conscious, intelligent, self-reflective human life. It leaves human beings in a rather existentially precarious situation. And so the point here is not that human beings need to feel better about themselves and so we need to come up with a cosmology that supports that. No. Um, the idea is to recognize that the conditions for the possibility of science itself are undermined by the picture of the universe that science is claiming is true. Right? And so there's a bit of a performative self-contradiction going on when a universe is described as purposeless and meaningless and some quantum physicists like um, Richard Feynman go so far as to say that nature is absurd. How could such a nature give rise to mathematical physicists? I think Whitehead allows us to have a more coherent understanding of the physical world and the cosmos while also um, giving us some deeper sense of meaning that wouldn't just be constructed. I should say on, on Sean Carroll's, in Sean Carroll's defense that he he takes this, this issue seriously, um, the kind of post-Nietzschean, you could say, uh, situation when all of the old sources of transcendent meaning have become incredible. Carroll realizes that we really do need to reconstruct some sense of value and meaning, but when it comes down to it, his version of these reconstructed values and meanings can't really be taken as anything more than a kind of doll's house version of purpose and meaning. It's, it's um, too superficial to really touch human beings at that deep level that we need to lead a meaningful life if we know that it's all made up anyways, right? Because really, the universe that science describes doesn't care about us, in his, in his words. <clears throat> so, What I do at the end of this paper is try to describe uh, science and physics in particular as a form of modeling and to understand what scientists are doing when they're devising models of the physical universe as a, a form of um, engaging in a form of propositional feeling. And I'm grateful to Lisa for explaining a bit about what Whitehead means by a proposition in the context of metaphysics and ontology. Um, I do hope we get to talk about this potential category error, error talking about proposition, propositions in logic versus uh, his later ontological category of propositions. But basically, a proposition is this complex form of feeling that compares uh, actual facts with possibilities. And when the scientist is engaging in uh, an attempt to model the physical world, they have some kind of instrumentation by which they collect measurements, and then they come up with mathematical models uh, to fit those measurements. There's a lot of um, free play there. Many models can explain the same data sets, especially when it's a science like cosmology where we have precious few data points. We, we, we can't 
really perform experiments on the whole universe, right? We're kind of sitting waiting for something to happen to observe with a telescope. And so physics has gotten into a position where the models have become so much more complex uh, than the amount of data that's available to constrain them. And I'm trying to uh, reinterpret what modeling is in a Whiteheadian way to try to bring physics back to its senses, right? And to recognize that, strictly speaking, any model of the physical world that science might come up with is false. Doesn't mean that it might not be useful. It doesn't mean that there might not be some asymptotic approach uh, to a more and more accurate, inclusive model of the physical world. But in Whitehead's view, as a pan-experientialist, uh, physical models of the world are always going to be leaving out what he calls the mental pull, right? The originative urges of the mental pull. The physical world is repetitive enough, this came up yesterday, that physicists don't really need to uh, take account of the mental urges, the originative urges that are, that are operative in um, electromagnetic radiation or you know, the movement of galaxies and stars, but nonetheless, in Whitehead's view, it's there. If it wasn't there, we wouldn't be here talking about it, right? But because physical models are leaving out the mental pull, strictly speaking, they are talking about an abstraction. They've, they've uh, split the universe in two for the practical purposes of coming up with predictive models. And that's fine, that's great. Whitehead's not saying science should stop modeling the world, he's just saying we need to put those models in proper metaphysical context and not allow them, because of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness, to become what we think of as really real, such that we have to then figure out how conscious agents like ourselves could have come out of an abstract model. Right? The answer is in no way, that, that's just not possible. So, two minutes or, yeah. So let me, let's see what I can add here. Um, yeah, the last thing I'll say here is a kind of theological point. I read um, one of Kant's pre-critical texts that he wrote in 1755 called, um, Universal Natural History and Theory of the Heavens, which is where he lays out his nebular hypothesis for how the solar system formed, and he's beginning to realize that the, what were called uh, nebula that astronomers, astronomers were observing were actually other galaxies, and so he's doing some um, cosmological speculation, but of course, in his um, 18th century context, very much in a theological mindset still, and it struck me in reading this text that for Kant, the mechanistic order and the mathematical harmony that he saw at work in the formation of the solar system and uh, the Milky Way and other galaxies was for him the best proof of God you could ever ask for. And less than a century later, the same mechanistic picture of the cosmos becomes the best proof of atheism you could ever ask for. So something major happened here, and I don't think it was so much a scientific transformation as a, as a moral transformation, right, in the evolution of human consciousness that uh, the kind of God that, the deist kind of God that Kant was still upholding became more and more incredible, and somehow scientists forgot that um, a mechanistic conception of the universe implies uh, an engineer behind it, right, so I've tried to ask some physicists what they mean by a law of physics, if, if understood in the classical Newtonian sense. Uh, if there is no lawgiver, if there is no designer. So strangely enough, I think the mechanistic picture of the cosmos is actually too theological. Uh, and we need a new conception of God, something like whiteheads, in order to better understand how such order and harmony uh, could be present in the universe. So I'll stop there and uh, very much look forward to dialogue.
thank you very much, Matt uh, and panel. And uh, the precursor to that, let me just note that, oh yes, I need to be close to the microphone. Uh, and uh, so my field is space physics, uh, more specifically space plasma physics. And I'd like to say, as a scientist, I reject scientism. As a physicist, I reject physicalism. And there's very specific reasons for this uh, that I outline in my work on tying the Gordian knot. That is that the way of knowing that is science is focused on model making uh, from measurement outputs from the way of numbers that you can map into spreadsheets and you can work with in a quantitative way and that our goal is this context independent development of mathematical representations as the essence of the scientific process and model making. That's the way of numbers. And then we have the way of knowing that is the way of context, emphasizing context as in the humanities, poetry, music more inclusively. So that's the way of context, the way of semiotic signs. So we have those two ways of knowing, of context independence, of, of context affirmation and emphasis, and the way I would argue of ultimate context. Three basic ways of knowing. Scientism claims that everything gets mapped down to reduce to nothing but the way of numbers. This is simply false. And Aaron Gehr has in response to the problems of the mechanistic descriptions and reductionist models that end up leading us to think that values and meaning and feelings and experience are mere epiphenomena instead of something that's real in the world. In response to that, Aaron Gehr calls us to affirming and developing a new natural philosophy for the 21st century something that goes beyond the corpuscular kinetic worldview of the 19th century as Milan Chopek had articulated it, something that goes beyond the mere reductionism and scientism of the past century, something that then can develop a framework of understanding that can help us all with the new ways of accommodating feelings and experience as an integral part of our reality for ourselves, for our community, for the world and make a real difference. I think our panel in each of their own ways are contributing to that and I'd like to first just ask one question of the panel before we turn to questions from the audience. My question to each of you is, how do you see your work as contributing to a new natural philosophy for the 21st century? Yeah, uh, essentially, um, yeah. Uh, Essentially, I, I think that my remit in the last 10 years of uh, being at the Whitehead Research Project and working on the critical edition has been to provide uh, new source text rather than doing my own interpreting. It's sort of a very different mindset. You want to keep your own interpretation out of it. But clearly, new critical editions of Whitehead's both published and unpublished work in these Harvard Lectures Notes and this project that I was discussing of revisiting some compositional uh, analysis of process and reality is going to provide more grist for the mill in terms of um, looking into Whitehead's uh, philosophy and perspective on, on uh, you know, a new natural philosophy for the 21st century. And so uh, I'm hoping to provide those resources, basically. Very good. Thanks. So I wouldn't say my work contributes to developing a new natural philosophy, um, but rather maybe trying to renegotiate what it means to do natural philosophy. And the reason I say that is because for the last few years, I've actually been teaching in the social sciences at the University of Chicago, specifically in anthropology. All my colleagues are uh, anthropologists, which is a big shift for me, um, having spent about 12 years at the Divinity School there. And what I've found is that there, there are too many questions being uh, broached in, in the social sciences about a non-representationalist, right, or uh, anti-worldview understanding of alterity and difference, um, of disagreement, so in ethnographic research, for instance. Um, and those anthropologists are very much drawing on Deleuze 
They're not reading Whitehead. They're not reading the American Pragmatists, right? They're, they're drawing on Deleuze because of the um, ontological uh, account of the concept that uh, is developed in a lot of his work. And I honestly think that Whitehead is a better suited for uh, their perspectivist approach that tries to get beyond a representationalist understanding um, of difference or alterity in talks in, in rather ontological, not epistemological terms of, of different worlds, right? Where perspectives are not wrong because they're plural but it's precisely the plurality, right, and their relativity to one another that grounds them in a more critical realism. So I, in a sense, what I've found though is that you're not gonna achieve your, your purposes in communicating this relevance by simply saying like, look, here's, here's the handbook on how to talk about reality, right? Here's a new natural philosophy, Whitehead's is the solution. Rather, you have to do things with it. Right? You have to show how it's usable to certain um, applicable ends, which is precisely what I think Whitehead would have wanted. Right? He's not going to say, let's only talk in terms of actual entities and prehensions, because he's not saying that those finally represent reality. And that's kind of the, the question that I was trying to address here. So in what sense is his system realist, pluralist, and relativist all for the same reason in such a way that he ha actually authorizes us to use it and to move beyond it, right? In a way that doesn't, uh, that kind of gives us a new metaphysics for what it means to do critical philosophy. That's excellent, thank you. Matt. <clears throat> Just to respond to what you were saying, Lisa, I think um, you should give the Deleuzian anthropologist some Bruno Latour because I think he draws on Whitehead and, and articulates this kind of pluralism in a really um, pragmatically inspired but deeply uh, process inspired as well um, philosophy of nature and uh, it's extremely applicable and you can show what it can do um, across different fields but they're probably aware of Latour already. Um, in terms of philosophy of nature uh, for the 21st century I actually think we have a lot to learn still from the um, early 19th century uh, German natural philosophers like Schelling, like Goethe, um, I think there's an alternative modern science that could have been born out of that period of research. And science took a different path, looking more into instrumental, uh, technologically focused forms of research and what I would say is it's not that technology and technoscience and instrumentalist approaches to building models that are operationalizable and so on, that, that that's totally useless. Obviously, it's very useful. But what these German natural philosophers like Goethe and Schelling would point out is that when we, when we forego our own healthy human sensory experience and replace it with the, the, the readings of these sophisticated detectors or telescopes or microscopes or whatever they may be, the universe revealed to us through these instruments is quite far removed from our embodied experience. And if Goethe was right that really the best scientific instrument we could ask for is our own human organism with its healthy suite of senses, then if we allow these instruments to take the lead when we do science, we run the risk of throwing our sense of reality out of proportion. And we do what I was trying to describe. We end up doing what I was trying to describe during my presentation of uh, explaining our own concrete human experience by reference to some model constructed out of the abstractions that we use to interpret uh, the data revealed by these instruments. And I think that's the wrong way around. And we can still do rigorous natural science uh, on a more phenomenological basis as, again, thinkers like Goethe and Schelling and later uh, Whitehead, though with a speculative twist, um, would allow us to do. So that's what I would say to that question, Tim. Thank you, thank you very much, Matt. Now for questions and, uh, from the audience. And when you uh, do speak up, please 
Please say your name and uh, indicate who you'd like to respond to your question. Thank you. Yeah, go to Hans Brunthub too, Lisa. Um, you were talking about Whitehead's theory of truth implicitly, and you can either have a metaphysical theory of truth, that truth is correspondence to the facts, or an epistemic, pragmatic, those are basically the two models, or you, you combine the, to the two and say, well, the, the definition of truth is correspondence, but the only criterion we have is um, coherence, something pragmatic, and it's pretty hard to figure out what Whitehead's theory of truth is. Do you think he has a metaphysical theory of truth, and is it, is it a kind of correspondence theory? And if it's not a correspondence theory, what is it? Or is it like what I just sketched, like Russia mixes, uh, uh, mixes the two, say, well, the definition is co correspondence, but the only criterion we have is coherence, epistemic. So um, I was trying to distill out of what you say what, what is Whitehead's theory of truth, and I can't just could, maybe you can help me to <laughs> pinpoint more directly what, what you think what his theory of truth is. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, you're right, I think there, there is simultaneously a sort of coherence theory of truth, a correspondence theory of truth, but not a correspondence of individual propositions and statements or words or ideas, right? But um, something uh, more holistic in that sense. So, uh, and that's why I, I wanted to draw on the idea of the matrix, the scheme as a matrix, and how truth functions only operate within a matrix, right? A sort of system. And so, I was trying to to parse out what he was saying about the scheme as a logical matrix, right? In which true propositions. Um, can come to be articulated in the logical sense or in the, the linguistic sense, um, but how he consistently says that their truth is only understandable in terms of, of clearly defined limits, right? And so I, I, I see him as kind of struggling with that honestly, um, is not really wanting to give it a, a direct theory of truth, um, but almost kind of deflating the notion um, a little bit and having it, it be very perspectival. But at the same time, he's not relativistic, right? He's not saying that anything goes. He's very much saying there are correct methods of generalization, right? These are the, as you mentioned, right? Coherence is one of the best regulative ideals for producing an effective scheme of ideas. Um, and there are certainly ways of thinking that he wants to correct. But I think first and foremost, you need to have um, a systematic universe of meaning, a, a matrix, right? And before you can even begin to um, deduce true propositions from it or to make helpful statements. Um, and so I think that, that the, the relativity of the scheme, the interrelation of ideas is, is really fundamental. And I think he never wants us to lose sight of the fact that what we're doing in philosophy, right, is working with language, right, working to divulge the presuppositions of language itself and not to be representing facts in a self-sustained way. So, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there is one true, uh, or <laughs> one clear theory of truth in, in Whitehead's work. I think he just very much is trying to show uh, the efficacy of properly formulated propositions. Hi, uh, Nicholas Rosinski, and uh, my comment, question, loving challenge, invitation, uh, speaks primarily to Matt's, Matt's contribution. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a very welcome exploration of physics and feeling, and I want to ground my comment in feeling that was, has only really been fleetingly present for me over the past day or so when John referred to uh, the possibility of sort of civilization scale apocalypse. And, uh, you know, metaphysics is beautiful, but I think the feelings of anguish and despair and impotence and, and hopefully urgency that's born of not of fear but of intelligence uh, are something that we can bring 
to this consideration. So my central comment, uh, lovingly, Matt, is I think that you're bringing a, a metaphysical knife to a civilization scale gunfight here. And my question, <clears throat> you know, you say in your paper <clears throat> something like, it, it's not a metaphysician's job to do experiments, and, and that's certainly true. But it's surely somebody's job to advocate for experiments that will lead to the changes in civilization scale dynamics that you're, you're passionately and correctly advocating for. So let me, let me try and give a, <clears throat> an example that might be relevant to this, my understanding of this group here. You know, God and Christ have no hands but mine. So when spirit is speaking to me through consciousness, the matter dynamics of this body must be changed compared to what physical science has to say. So there's, there's experiments there. They're not about iPads flying up to the ceiling. They're about the relationship between consciousness and matter. So my question is, why are we so scared of getting our hands dirty in science and, and, and advocating for an experimental approach to an expanded naturalism where, where conscious and ma consciousness and matter talk to each other? I certainly I thank you for your your comment and that question. I certainly wouldn't want to discourage uh, experimental scientists from doing whether it's neuroscientific research or sociological research or whatever form it takes to understand how um, what we call consciousness can interact with what we call matter. Um, my project, which maybe knife bringing a knife to a gunfight is one way of looking at it. I'm, I'm trying to use a scalpel and be delicate in my treatment of, of science and, and physics. I want to understand before I criticize as best that I can without having uh, the decades plus worth of mathematical training to grasp the real details of it. But The, the question for me as a metaphysician with the scalpel's knife is, well, what do we mean by consciousness and what do we mean by matter? And before we do the experiments, can we arrive at a, uh, to put those terms in a metaphysical context wherein we all know what we're talking about? I don't, I think we were speaking yesterday about how there's no real definition of matter in physics, nor do they much care to try to define it. Um, it's more about making predictions that the next particle accelerator can hopefully verify or not. Yeah. And what it is that they're interacting with is, I mean, they have names for it, but what is it? No, they don't care. Um, I, I, I would like to know the is questions, and I think we need a metaphysics that can provide us with some, um, some way of, of grokking and making sense of the data and the theories of physics. Um, so that we can then relate it to our own consciousness. But I'm certainly not opposed to experimental work uh, to speak the language of scientists, as it were, um, to open them to the possibility that the universe cannot be exhaustively explained just by reference to the physical side of the equation. So we should talk more about what experiments uh, might be done here. But yeah, thank you. Nancy Frankenberry. Um, this question is for Joe. Simple informational question. Uh, but first, I should say congratulations. I, th I think what you are producing is historic. It's of real importance. Um, the question is, obviously, this is a long-range project. But when do you expect the critical edition of Whitehead to be completed? <laughs> Completed, huh? Uh, <laughs> wild guess, 20, 45, 50? <laughs> I'm not kidding. I mean, we produced two volumes so far, and there were, there were uh, four years between them, and uh, we're planning on having, I think, 17 volumes. It's going to be a little while. Um, our, our current plans, just for a little bit of information, is... We've done first the two, first two volumes of Harvard lectures. There's going to be six of those, but we're taking a temporary pause and doing two volumes of Whitehead's collected essays and articles. So that's the next thing we're working on that we'll be putting out, and we're hoping that those are going to be out in about two years. And 
those should be really helpful because they're it's putting everything in a chronological order and restoring, in some cases, some of these articles had been cut down as they'd been published later. Some of them haven't been seen at all. We, we found two great essays in papers donated by Whitehead's uh, grandson that no one had seen. Um, and so they're going to be great resources, but it's going to take a while. It's basically me and Brian Henning working on it, and we're bringing in other editors as needed for some of the individual volumes, but we can only do so much. Um, this question is for Dr. Siegel. Thanks so much for your paper. It was so good. I could ask a ton of questions, but the one thing that um, that was like really, uh, I, I know that you love history, and I was wondering about your reflections on that transition in worldview. So you mentioned that um, Kant really sees God in math, and then about you know 100 or so years later, people and scientists are looking at math and saying, that's the reason why God doesn't exist. That's a huge transition in thinking. Do you have any thoughts on how that flip uh, emerged? It's extremely complicated, but I think I would want to resist the typical version of that story, which is um, Charles Taylor calls it the, sub the subtraction thesis that basically um, superstitious belief was removed and all that was left was the scientific facts and we gradually just came to accept um, the picture of nature that science was revealing and didn't need any theological um, backdrop for it. But I think it's much more complicated than that. I, Charles Taylor's book, A Secular Age, does a great job of giving a sort of thick description of all the sociological factors that go into this. It's much more than just a matter of science advancing in its knowledge of nature. It's a moral transformation. It's a cultural shift. The political, I mean, I think the French Revolution has a lot to do with it. If you understand the sorts of metaphors and analogies that work in the subterranean level of the human psyche when you execute the king and, you know, uh, get rid of this ancient ordering of society and start fresh with totally rationalized laws and calendar, you know, and everything starting fresh, as was the attempt of the French Revolution, um, you can see how it also follows that the whole idea of the need for a divine lawgiver to order the universe also doesn't matter. Human beings begin to deify themselves, and um, if the, you know, world has any meaning or purpose, it's because we create it and bring it into the, the world, and so, yeah, it's, it's a very complicated picture. Um, you know, Darwin, uh, several decades after, uh, 50 or 60 years after Kant um, had passed, develops his theory of natural selection, which also accelerated this process of um, people taking on a more naturalistic worldview. So it's a very good question. I, you know, it would take a whole seminar to unpack all of the, the factors there, but it's striking to see how quickly that shift occurred. Okay, um, thank you very much for your presentations. I, uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, my, question for, my question for Lisa was taken away by Godehard. Uh, it was going in the same direction, but uh, I do want to mention a really great uh, source uh, I find that are the last two pages of uh, the aims of education, especially the last two paragraphs of the entire book. Uh, Whited writes there, I emphasize the point that our, exact, that our only exact data as to the physical world are our sensible perceptions. We must not slip into the fallacy of assuming that we are comparing a given world with the given perceptions of it. The physical world is in some general sense of the term a deduced concept. Our problem is, in fact, to fit the world to our perceptions and not our perceptions to the world. And I, I find that to be a very... And, and previously he talks about um, a certain superstructure that we can find in our perceptions of the world. And that's basically where his theory of truth is grounded. And so I just wanted to share that. But I have a question for Matthew, because I work a lot with practitioners of all sorts, namely also farmers, foresters, gardeners, and scientists uh, of these environmental fields. And um, my experience is that they have a very 
strong sense of uh, maybe intuition, but I would maybe rather call it empathy. And in your um, in your first uh, at, like in your first comment after uh, your presentation, you mentioned to use your body as an as a scientific tool or as a as a tool for measurement. And I personally feel like uh, um, the empathic connection that we can build up with a plant, for example, or with another person, uh, we can immediately tell whether they're healthy or not. Um, and we can also tell whether an ecosystem is flourishing or not. So I was wondering uh, if you can, in your experience uh, with uh, scientists and also in your academic uh, perspective, could you see empathy as a form of... Uh, like a research methodology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so briefly, part of what I do in the paper is attempt to overcome Hume's is-ought dichotomy and you know, Whitehead's understanding that every fact is the expression of some value um, allows us to do that in a way that, that isn't silly. It isn't just a matter of what you know, doing what Hume was worried, where you derive an is, or you derive a not from an is, which we don't want to fall prey to that um, that sort of thing. But in terms of the methodology of empathy, or um, what what Goethe called delicate empiricism, where very much in the domain of um, botany, Goethe developed this methodology of perceiving the growth of plants in such a way that his own imagination through a sort of sympathetic resonance, and I would say in Whitehead's terms, through a um, prehension of propositional feelings active in the plant itself that one can come to share as the observer, uh, Goethe was able to gain insight into you know, what he described as a kind of dynamic archetypal pattern that's expressing itself in the plant and this harkens back to an ancient Greek conception in Aristotle of how we come to know the forms of things through a sort of sympathetic resonance. And that has been lost um, after Kant, well, the Descartes and Kant and this whole modern philosophical and scientific development that um, led us not to trust our senses um, and instead to trust mathematical models. And I think we need to recover what's been lost because losing that sympathetic contact with the world and, and the capacity to take it seriously as a deliverance of real facts and values uh, is, it's basically we're, we've decapitated ourselves. So, yeah. Thanks okay, for that we're, question. We're running over time, so I think at most two more questions. I know we have one question in front. What do you have back there, Andrew? Okay, one question there, one question here. We need to conclude after this question. Okay, please speak up. So. Thank you. Um, this question is for Matt. Um, you specifically uh, brought in Goethe's um, empiricism, and um, in doing so, you said healthy sense perception. Um, and I was wondering how much there might be room for atypical um, experiences that are not the average. Um, in that as well, and um, I, I imagine in Whitehead there is a little bit more, but I was wondering for Goethe and Schelling um, how much room there is for like uh, the creation of something new through our new senses, or maybe even the development of new sense percep perceptions that haven't been developed yet. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, by healthy, I mean, in a sense, um, our senses are like muscles and we have to cultivate them for them to become capable of, of accurate perception. Um, you know, musicians have very cultivated hearing and painters have very cultivated eyesight and um, you don't automatically develop that sort of skill unless you train. And I do absolutely think that there are, as it were, other organs of perception that are kind of dormant within us that can be developed. Goethe and Schelling thought of the imagination as such a, an organ, which um, we all, just by nature, instinctually have the capacity for some degree of imaginative um, reflection and, and speculation and, um, and dreaming and so on, but you can actually 
Goethe thought, cultivate imagination as an organ of perception um, that gives us insight into the formative processes of the organic world, right? And so it's not that anyone can just do it. It's very easy to project onto what you're observing. But Goethe thought with training, you can come to actually participate in what you're observing, the plant, let's say, you can participate into its formative processes of growth and be in sympathy with it so that you're not projecting in a way you're absorbing, right, what's there, but that your physical eyes aren't able to see without this imaginative organ of perception. So yeah, I think that's absolutely possible. We're, we're gonna need to conclude. So join me, a very rich dialogue. We've, we've uh... Th thank you, Tim, and to the panelists. We're gonna enter a 15 minute break. Coffee should be hot. Uh, it'll be a rush to the restroom, but we're gonna start promptly at 11 o'clock with our next session. So stand up and stretch, and we'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Got a lot of questions. <laughs> I hope our, um, I haven't read your paper yet, but I know you sent it, so I afford that. Oh, don't read that one. <laughs> don't read that one? Okay. <laughs> Let me send you a new version. Please do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of, I hope, I, I think there's an anthology coming. I'm not sure how it will be organized, oh, but there's okay. a lot of um, interplay and overlap between the topics okay. that we're covering, and so they, they'd go well in an anthology, I think. I did. Oh. I didn't even read like half my page. <laughs> I think it's like since I've been a professor, I speak slow. And so my like standard twenty minute talk used to be twelve pages, now it's like eight. No. <laughs> That's why I don't even try to read anymore and just try to summarize. Yeah, I should I should have just done that. Yeah. <laughs> didn't even get to the God talk. I know, that's the interesting part, so I, I, look, <laughs> I look forward to reading that. I'll remind you. Thank you. <laughs> part as a philosopher as I can't 
you know, which, yeah, I need which, uh, what to look yeah, at. The more I looked at um, the really meaty part of the dissertation, the, the, the chapters after the introduction, of cha everything after chapter one, mm -hmm. the more I was like, I can't do this in 20 minutes. <laughs> Whether I talk about your, your you know, because I got your, you have a whole chapter, or I have a whole chapter on your work, and when really, do a I get to read a really it? chapter and a half. <laughs> it's painful, um, like I'm going to have to And But the more I looked at the rest of it, I'm like, no, I can't do this. I can't do justice to what I want to do. So I just like, I'll stick to the internet. Oh, those questions just, when, when I said I didn't write the, write, write the paper I wanted to. Um, do you want water? Do you want water? I wanted to be able to, I wanted to talk about it a little bit more, um, more than just introducing my question. But, you know, the question I think, I think it's an interesting question, which is why I do it, so here we go. <laughs> Being, <laughs> what matters more? <laughs> It's crucial not to get into too much detailed argumentation. I mean, no one will take it in a place like that. No. A situation like this. It's right. This is an enormous number of presentations. <laughs> Did you get some sun? Did you get to? All, I think we'd all just like get to get it over with. So yes. <laughs> we're all chilling in it. We're refrigerating. Okay, friends, we're going to get started with our next session. If you would find your way to your seat. Keep in mind, we have a full stock of coffee for the afternoon session after lunch. We'll make sure we're having enough energy. Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine Keller, who will be moderating our next session. She is the George T. Cobb Professor of <clears throat> excuse me, Constructive Theology in the Graduate Division of Religion at Drew University. She works amidst the tangles of eco-social, pluralist, feminist philosophy of religion and theology. Some of her books include The Face of the Deep, On the Mystery, Cloud of the Impossible, and Political Theology of the Earth. She's co-edited several volumes in the Drew Transdisciplinary Theological Colloquium, most recently, Political Theology on the Edge, Ruptures of Justice and Belief in the Anthropocene. And her latest monograph is Facing Apocalypse, Climate, Democracy, and Other Last Chances. So today she'll be moderating our second session, New Materialism, Post-Structuralism, and Process Philosophy. Please welcome Dr. Keller. Greetings all, and welcome to this session on new materialism, post-structuralism, and process philosophy, or some complex spiral of those and many other foci. I want to introduce to you first Dr. Richard Livingston, who's the executive director of the Cobb Institute. He was the director of operations from 2019 to 21 got his PhD in 2015 from Claremont Graduate University, where he'd specialized in philosophy of religion and theology. He taught as an adjunct instructor in philosophy and religious studies at four colleges in Southern California from 2011 to 19, and has worked in IT since the early 1990s. It's intimidating. He holds a master's degree in theology from the University of Chicago and a bachelor's degree in Near Eastern Studies from Brigham Young University. Welcome, Richard. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Andrew, for the invitation. The purpose of this presentation is to provide an introduction to the primary question of my dissertation, and I hope eventually a book. <laughs> Perhaps the number one reason that I chose to do my PhD in philosophy of religion and theology is that during the first couple of years of my graduate studies, it became increasingly clear that I had a problem with promiscuity. No, not that kind. <laughs> Get your mind out of the gutter. 
It was just that I, I was open to, really open to, really interested in many modes of thought. And I couldn't quite make up my mind. I still really can't make up my mind. I wasn't, I wasn't interested so in, in religious studies or theology or philosophy alone. But I felt most comfortable wandering the boundary between those multifarious modes of thought. So unable to determine where my theological questions end and my philosophical questions begin and vice versa, and unwilling to take a stand for or against either side, I gravitated toward the complex and contested interstitial space where I could be informed by and create conversations between both. So feeling at home, most at home, in a place of homelessness, when I began thinking about possible dissertation topics, I was determined to find a way to consider the contours of their connections. And this presented a huge challenge because philosophy and theology by themselves, as you know, are notoriously elusive, massively diverse, and highly contestable. There are countless ways of engaging in philosophical and theological reflection, so there's no single right answer to the question, what is philosophy or what is theology? But for all of the ways in which they might be individually unique, the nature of their relation to one another presents an even greater set of difficulties. Are they opposed to each other, independent of one another, complementary, interdependent, etc.? Despite the enduring tensions and sometimes bitter conflicts between them, one of the defining features that philosophy and theology have shared in common is their in the endeavor to make sense of that which is viewed as ultimate in some, si some significant or even primordial sense. On the philosophical side, you've got examples like Plato's Demiurge or Aristotle's Prime Mover, Whitehead's Divine Poet, on the theological side, you've got examples like Hinduism's Brahman, Judaism's Yahweh, Christianity's God. Examples could be multiplied many times over, but what they all demonstrate is that some notion of an ultimate or transcendent or infinite, whether it's expressed in the form of an impersonal universal principle or a personal supreme being or transpersonal reality, has played a pivotal role within their respective settings. And coming to an understanding of its meaning and significance has been and continues to be of paramount importance for both and for me. But things get messy in a hurry because the philosophical ultimate has often been connected to or identified with the theological ultimate. Are they the same? Different? What's their relation to one another? Put differently, the effort to elucidate an understanding of the divine reality has commonly been intimately intertwined with the endeavor to articulate a view of being itself. The result is that, as at least one philosopher puts it, the linkage of the problem in being and the question of God has been one of the more durable features of the legacies of philosophical and theological reflection in Western thought. Aristotle provides one of the earliest and most influential examples when he links what he calls first philosophy or the science or logos of being, ontology, with the science or logos of God, theology. In his metaphysics, he tries to find a fundamental science that can rationally ground or logically explain everything that exists in the most universal terms. For him, the sensible objects or material entities require a reason for being both what they are and that they are in order for the cosmos to be rationally comprehensible. He eventually finds a foundational ontological principle in a theological proof. His demand that the universe be explicable eventually leads him to the conclusion that God is the purely actual substance or the eternal entity that provides the explanatory ground of all entities because it is the foundational principle of the movement of entities from potentiality to actuality. His prime mover thus constitutes the primary ground of beings and the explanatory principle of motion in all particular beings. Many other individuals like this could be mentioned, like Aquinas' idea of God as being itself, Spinoza's causa sui, Hegel's absolute spirit, Tillich's ground of being, 
The point here is that an enormous amount of Western thought has been dominated by the idea that there's a fundamental connection and sometimes absolute identity between God and being. So given the singular importance of these notions of ultimacy, I wanted to explore some, some of the possibilities for understanding the distinction and the connections between them in a contemporary setting. So to set the stage for my guiding question and bring it more sharply into focus, I draw on the work of 20th century philosopher Martin Heidegger. His persistent and perceptive engagement with the question of being and the question of God has been considered crucial to this discussion by a number of prominent thinkers, including many theologians, in part because he identifies and articulates some pivotal problems in a very potent and profound way. His views are complex and compelling, even if not always clear and consistent. Among his research notes written shortly before his death in 1976, Heidegger summarized his entire life's work as an on the way in the field of paths for the challenging, changing question, changing questioning of the manifold question of being. Because the question is multifaceted and the subject is utterly unique, Heidegger never attempts to articulate a comprehensive thesis or develop a definitive definition of being. Instead, he approaches it from a variety of vantage points. One will thus search his writings in vain if one wants to locate a final formulation of the sentence, being is X. Indeed, as we'll see, any such locution would betray his consistent critique of precisely the kind of thinking that he wants to overcome. Put differently, he's never interested in discovering the essential nature of being in the way that, say, an astrophysicist might be interested in discovering the nature of galaxies, or a biologist might be interested in discovering the nature of living beings. Whatever might be said about being, it is not a being. So it isn't amenable to, the ana to analysis in the way that empirically observable entities can be analyzed. So he thinks that the way in which being should be interrogated needs to, be ra needs to radically differ from the kind of inquiry undertaken in order to ex explicate everyday entities. Nonetheless, Heidegger's most important public engagement with the question of being begins with the open lines of his most influential book, Being in Time. The epigraph to the opening chapter is a quote from Plato's Sophist. This is what the... What the, what the the dialogue, the Platonic dialogue says, for manifestly you have long been aware of what you mean when you use the expression being. We, however, who used to think we understood it, have now become perplexed. Some 24 centuries later, are we in any better position to respond to this ontological puzzlement? Do we in our time have an answer to the question of what we really mean by the word being, Heidegger asks? For the next five decades, his response is consistently, not at all. The difficulty immediately doubles, however, because not only do we lack an answer to the question of what we mean, but what he, he thinks we also lack an awareness that we don't have an answer. Not only have we forgotten what we mean by being, but we've also forgotten that we don't know what we mean. And this sort of double forgetting is what Heidegger has in mind when he speaks of the oblivion of being. So while Dasein might be the one for whom being is an issue, the full significance of being has long been lost, covered over by layer upon layer of traditional ways of thinking about and being in the world. It is fitting, he therefore says, that we should raise anew the question of the meaning of being. Indeed, because he was convinced that the thought of being had remained in oblivion from at least Plato onward, destructuring or deconstructing traditional understandings on the one hand and re-raising and reconsidering the ontological question in new ways on the other constitute the pivotal axes around which his entire corpus swirls. So why did he think that we remain in a kind of oblivion to or estrangement from being itself? Heidegger's answer can be expressed in a single word, metaphysics. Now, it's important to know that for him, metaphysics isn't just limited to the kind of intellectual activity that some sort of nerdy philosophers do while sitting at their desks. But instead, it involves a kind of pervasive paradigm, a general understanding or shared perspective held in common by an entire people, a way of thinking and being that shapes their most basic presuppositions about the world, and thus constitutes a kind of comprehensive horizon for understanding what it means for anything to be at all. So as he famously wrote in a lesser known essay, metaphysics grounds an age, 
by which he meant that through a particular comprehension of truth, it provides that age with the ground of its essential shape. The ground comprehensively governs all decisions distinctive of the age. In all the various ways that human beings relate to one another and other beings, they are, according to Heidegger, in every respect sustained and guided by metaphysics. Now, the primary reason he thinks that metaphysics has concealed or hidden the truth of being itself is that at its core, it only thinks beings as beings. So wherever the question is asked what beings are, beings as such are in sight. Questions like, what is it to be a being? Or what is the fundamental structure and nature of beings? Or what is the essential beingness of beings? That's the central concern of metaphysics. And because its interest is entities as entities, he thinks that it isn't able to turn itself to being as being. It conceals being, or as he puts it, metaphysics is the oblivion of being. And that means the history of the concealment and withdrawal of that which gives being. Even those thinkers who have explicitly attempted to give an account of being, so like Aristotle, uh, Aquinas, Leibniz, and Hegel, they've been driven by a kind of impure motive to illuminate beings qua beings, or the being of beings, or the totality of beings. But the truth of being in itself, and as such, remains hidden. So in saying that metaphysics is a matter of the essence of entities and entities uh, as a whole, Heidegger means that its primary objective is to represent them or give an account of them in a logically unified, ordered, and coherent way. As with Aristotle noted above, in order to do that, it, it must provide a logical reason for beings. It must give a causal account of beings. It must systematize beings. It must ground beings in an irrefutable and indestructible rational foundation because it seeks the ultimate origin, source, and reason for the existence of beings. His critique of the metaphysical fixation on foundations is, for me, most concisely and cogently captured in a critical analysis of Hegel in his 1957 lecture, The Ontotheological Constitution of Metaphysics. In it, Heidegger, Heidegger issues one of his many calls to overcome metaphysics. And I can't stress this enough. Overcoming for Heidegger does not mean to destroy or obliterate metaphysics. Instead, it's to deconstruct and transcend it. That is, to examine its historical origins, to consider its conceptual roots, and expose its essential elements in order to open up the possibility of pursuing novel approaches. According to his account of the history of philosophy, since its inception with the ancient Greeks, Western metaphysics has eminently been both ontology and theology. Inasmuch as metaphysics asks about the beings as such and as a whole, the wholeness of this whole is the unity of all beings that unifies the generative ground. To those who can read, he writes, this means metaphysics is ontotheology. Put differently, he argues that metaphysical thinking moves simultaneously in two directions that are distinguishable but not separable. So from its ontological side, metaphysics asks questions like, what are beings in general as beings? Or what is an entity as an entity? What is it for an entity to be? It is ontology because it gives a rational account, or logos, of the on, he, on, the Greek on, the Greek word on, in terms of beings qua beings. It thinks about entities in general, which means that it seeks to explicate the essential element that's common to all entities or the most general ground of entities. It is, in other words, concerned with the ground-giving unity of what is universal because what is you know, most general in beings is universally applicable to all beings. Metaphysics is thus ontology when it investigates beings insofar as they are beings, beings in general, or the being of beings. And it elucidates, or tries to elucidate, the absolute bedrock or ultimate foundation beyond which inquiry about entities can go no further. From its theological side, metaphysics asks questions like, which being is the highest, and in what way is it? What entity is the supreme, paradigmatic, or, exemp or exemplary sense, and in what sense is it? What is the reason for beings? What is the primordial source of beings? It is theology because it strives to give a rational account, or logos, of the theon, or supreme being, who is the ultimate cause and highest existent ground of being. 
It thinks of the totality of beings or beings as such and as a whole and is chiefly concerned with the founding unity of all that accounts for the ground, which is the highest being. As theology, metaphysics thus seeks to render the totality of beings intelligible by bringing it into correlation with a supreme or divine being. Metaphysics is thus theology when it inquires into the ultimate meaning and source of the being of beings, and when it attempts to establish the primordial foundation from which all beings issue and by which they can be explained and justified in a divine being. For Heidegger, then, the essential constitution of metaphysics is based on the unity of beings as such, in, and this is his words, in the universal and that which is the highest universal and that which is the highest. Taken together, the universal and the highest, they're two sides of a single coin, two logoi that have been fused together, intimately intertwined in such a way that is neither the one nor the other alone, but simultaneously both at once. Hence, onto, hyphen, theo, hyphen, logi. Each side seeks to establish a rational foundation. Ontologically, it establishes the ground from the bottom up by generalizing the essence of entities as such. That is, ontology grounds by delimiting the bedrock beneath, beneath which the metaphysician's investigations cannot penetrate further. Theologically, it establishes the ground from the top down by formulating a conception of the supreme being that justifies the existence of beings. That is, theologically grounds by determining the source from which all entities ultimately issue and by which they can be subsequently justified. Therefore, says Heidegger, all metaphysics is at bottom and from the ground up what grounds. What gives account of the ground, what is called to account by the ground, and finally what calls the ground to account. Now part of his worry here is that in addition to concealing the meaning and truth of being, metaphysics also conceals the meaning and truth of God. The metaphysical God is understood in terms of things like logical necessity and fashioned into a principle that provides an ultimate explanation of things that is firmly, firmly secured in place by means of human reason. As Heidegger famously chides, before the causa sui, man can neither fall to his knees in awe, nor can he play music and dance before this God. Such an abstract and depersonalized deity is not worthy of devotion, reverence, and worship. On the one hand, then, metaphysics has prevented philosophy from thinking about being in terms other than beings. And on the other, it has misconstrued the nature of God, thereby obstructing our relationship with the divine. More deserves to be said, but with his critique of the ontotheological essential constitution of metaphysics, I think he offers an incisive and insightful, even if sometimes conflicting and controversial critique, of the entire being as beings as being and the God as ground of being tradition. To be sure, there are deep disagreements in the scholarship about just exactly what onto theology finally comes to. It's penchant for sweeping generalizations and massive oversimplifications the quality of its interpretation of historical figures, how one ought to respond if in fact it is valid. Even so, his critique provides a powerful lens through which to focus the question of the relation between being and God in a contemporary setting, and what that might mean for thinking and speaking of these notions in novel and enriching ways. Put differently, just as his deconstruction of ontotheology is intended, at least in part, to disentangle die Seinsfrage from die Gottesfrage, the question of being from the question of God, for the purpose of thinking about being in, a, in an originary way, the central question guiding my project is the following. After the critique of ontotheology, what is the relation between being and God? So to conclude, my primary thesis is that the relation involves a mutual dependency and an inseparable connection without collapsing into an absolute identity. Successfully showing this requires, as Heidegger himself suggests, drawing out some unexpected distinctions and connections. So what I try to do is put three radically different approaches into a crit critical conversation with one another to consider alternative ways of refiguring the relation. The first is Schubert Ogden, well-known process the thinker, who wants to supersede onto theology by means of a transcendental metaphysics. The second is Jean-Luc Marion, who wants to exceed onto theology by means of a saturated phenomenology. And the third is Catherine Keller, 
who wants to unseat ontotheology by means of a post-structural chaosmology. My hope in my project is that by disrupting commonly accepted delimitations through a critical comparative exploration of the ontotheological connection, an eruption of illumination might unfold. Namely, that everything that is has an evental and relational quality, such that to be at all is to happen, take place, or occur within some event horizon. That being essentially occurs as event because beings essentially occur as events. That every being is a novel expression of creativity. That God is the universal instantiation or infinite expression of the creative advance into novelty. And finally, that the relation between being and God is most adequately understood in terms of an inseparable connection and reciprocal dependency rather than an absolute identity. Thank you. Yes, so I'm very glad now to be able to introduce Ruth Chad Garcia Aramilo. And Ruth is adjunct professor and lecturer in the art, social sciences, and humanities at Lynn Benton Community College. She's a PhD candidate in the philosophy of religion, process studies program at Claremont School of Theology, where she's working on her dissertation under the mentorship of Drs. Roland Faber, Philip Clayton, and Andrew Schwartz. Ruth is also the Library and Archives Manager at the Center for Process Studies, whew, a faculty-based research center of CST. Her areas of research and teaching include topics within global environmental ethics, eco-aesthetics, post-structuralism, de-anthropocentrism, queer studies, and Dharmic philosophical religious traditions. And I hear Ruth is also a composer and musician who enjoys playing the harp trail running, mushroom hunting, and surfing <laughs> the P&W coast whenever possible. <laughs> so I read. <laughs> Welcome, Ruth. Oh, dear goodness. If they had told me in advance Dr. Keller would be the moderator for my paper presentation, I would have said, please just don't introduce me, just be kind, okay? <laughs> just don't, don't tear me apart too much. <laughs> it's cold in here today, so I am put my coat back on because I'm a little chilly. Yeah. Um, you know, my work at this point, as a, as a research scholar primarily, um, is mostly concerned with emergent advances in uh, AI and kind of exo philosophy topics, as well as post Anthropocene topics that are interesting to me. And um, I, they're interesting because, like many of you have noted, they're imperatives for our time. Uh, my dissertation is, is titled uh, Toward Transhuman Futures, Dreams of a Post-Anthropocene Ecopoiesis. And due to like six years plus of studying under uh, Dr. Roland Faber, I'm just about as grateful as someone could be to, you know, kind of look after these, these uh, ideas and their labors of love that I'm very grateful for. So, <clears throat> quite simply, I'm interested in neither the image about what is deep meaning, per se, nor the representation, nor the hall of, you know, reflected mirrors, endless, but I am interested in systems of relations. And so in lieu of that, and in lieu of the rapid pace and change that globalization um, requires in our interconnected age, in hopes for a more peaceful, healthy, uh, abundant, and hopefully like surviving species, <laughs> um, we, we really must bring our rigor to a, an aim that is interested in the reorganization of what it means to dwell in the earth, ethopolitically, ecologically, et cetera. I say all these things because I'm standing at a podium, so I feel obligated to just preach my perspective, so I apologize. It's 
it's the podium here that <laughs> is pulling out the, <laughs> the seriousness. You know, Anthropocene techno-industrialism has the um, ability and the power, really, we, and the power, it's not separate, it's within human um, evolution and uh, to both disenchant and reconstruct um, our environments for future, future, hopefully future, global society within the possibilities of play, not, <clears throat> not just crisis. Um, and additionally, theories related to information sharing and information systems are useful in this and in particular relevance to my, to my focus. So uh, I, I suppose maybe be, before beginning, pro, prolegomenon, you know, before the actual speaking, um, perhaps I am in line with um, somewhat of a prayer of a mentor or, you know, leader in thought for me, Michel Serres, who this paper is kind of devoted to in relation to White's, Whitehead's process philosophy, um, that, that, we may, uh, that we may find a way back to the lightness, the lightness uh, instead of lead, paying our way in the world with bullets and death, we can use you know, the lightness of a feather, the quill of a pen, um, that we may enchant, reconstruct, and may our science get to a point beyond our own death drive. Okay, <laughs> that's a passion, a prayer of mine. Amen. Love is the third. It is third uh, between two. It is exactly the included third, always between, between science and ignorance, neither indigent nor wealthy, neither dead nor immortal. It is placed without precision and with, with rigor in the laws of the logic of the fuzzy. And it lives in this fuzzy area of the threshold, homeless, transient, near the door, at the doorway, leaving the party, coming back, a little lost. It is the third, excluded and included. Um, philosopher Michel Serge wrote that the theory of being ontology brings us to atoms, and the theory of relations brings us to the parasite. So if ever there were a thinker who clarified that, uh, which we have come to call post-human, that, that it's indeed not that which simply comes about after humanism. It most definitely, or assuredly in my opinion, is Michel Serres. Um, current discourse offers renderings of the post in post-human as being that in which, so the story goes, the human is transformed and finally eclipsed or obliterated, that's my bracket, by various technologic, informatic, and bioengineering developments rooted in the 20th century and then greatly accelerated by the practical demands of two, possibly three, my brackets, world wars and cold wars that continue to chill diplomacy internationally to the present moment. In contrast to this perspective, uh, Serre's uh, view and his work in, in philosophy was a bit controversial in its time um, for, for many reasons. Uh, it, his, his perspective asserts that in a half playful way, and also borrowing from Bruno Latour, that, that we have never been fully human. His book is, we've never been fully modern. We've never been modern. If by defining human as the free agent, the citizen builder of the Leviathan, the distressing visage of the human person, the other of a relationship consciousness, the cogito, the hermeneut, the inner self, the thee and thou, blah, blah, presence to oneself, intersubjectivity, I don't say blah, blah lightly. The thou tatvam asi, I, you know, I deeply carry that. But the list goes on. Um, in contrast to Latour, Serres does not simply assert, but rather assumes the performative act in his work. Um, and it is a labor of love um, that I believe we are all here for and doing in our, in our lives. Um, in which his transdisciplinary understandings, his background and understanding of mathematics and science are interwoven and threaded in a, in a litany of books. I think it was over 35 titles maybe by the end of his life. Um, but The Parasite was actually translated um, by John Hopkins University Press in the early 80s, just giving a nod. And then later, um, the translation I'm working from is um, from many decades later or not many decades, oof, one decade later. Um, what makes his work in The Parasite, this is the book that I'm referencing in my paper, particularly interesting to this conversation in dialogue with process philosophy, is the very post-human preoccupation, 
um, which according to Sayers actually subtends and precedes um, the human, both ontologically and epistemologically, with uh, the preoccupation with unity, oneness, kind of a obsession with, um, and what he does is he consequently upends this notion by showing the very composite nature through use of the parasite, and that's the tool um, that is useful to this conversation today. Um, of course, the challenge is not so much to expose the false tidiness of unities in themselves, and I remain in line with a, num a number of other thinkers. Of course, I am bound to uh, Faber in this regard uh, in terms of the rhizomatic um, nature of, of relations and organisms, that we are little sure of the one as of the multiple. We've never hit upon truly atomic, multiple, indivisible terms that were not themselves, once again, composite. So that is to say, the, the bottom always goes out. Um, terre sans terre. The, the ground is, there is no ground. Um, beneath our feet, anytime we go on the quest for something elementary or, you know, at the, at the ground of it all. But further, um, the irreducibly individual perpetually receives like the horizon as our analyses advance. So the problem, I see, as I see it, is how to how difficult it is to perform the thinking. And this is also uh, something to play with as an object for new philosophy. And it is not play for the sake of mental play and you know stimulation um, for the sake of stimulation. It is for the sake of uh, embracing that space between where there is noise and where the parasite becomes a way of endeavoring to make a better world. Hmm. So there must be some kind of strangeness involved in that that looses language itself from the death mark of our wonderful advance as a species. Um, so in terms of the parasite, I wanted to talk about that for a minute because in Serre's um, understanding of it and in, in the French as well, the, the word uh, haute, la haute, la haute is, is just having to do with host, but it also in the French means the host and the guest, so it's both and. Um, the relationship between host and parasite in this sense is less a drain on the en energy. We're not looking at parasite as something that just drains an organism, but rather something that changes the very nature of the host because the minute you open your door um, to the strange or the stranger, you are mm, giving of yourself, but you're also engaging in a, a kind of social exchange that also changes you. For example, um, types of parasites that are interesting to me, and also many others, of course, um, here today, are biological types of um, systems that interplay together. Parasite is an organism that lives in a body or under the skin. It harms the host. Generally speaking, it takes something in a one way without providing benefit. Uh, it's also a social reference. Um, and actually, the social might have come, bef it actually kind of did come before the biological sciences because it was a way of referencing um, particularly oppressed, systematically oppressed people groups and minorities. And that came about because of agriculture. And informational, the parasit, the parasit is the static. And this is an area of great interest to me because the static is the place of noise in relation to uh, a system. So for Sarah's, an organized system exists in opposition to noise And static is not static like something not moving or not living or not being. Um, it, in the sense, and he wrote primarily, he did write um, this book in French, the word static ha is coming from an information theory um, basis and refers to an interruption in the signal, a break in a chain of communication and so forth. So, as a pragmatic tool for this, noise is an exciter. It's a form of kind of a thermal exciter that is kind of, in my view, the, the you can say whatever you want, the modern, the postmodern, the neo-postmodern, the, I heard someone say late, er, earlier the post-Nietzschean, neo-Nietzschean, neo I don't know. Um, this is the prerogative of the human, you know, free will agent choice to kind of go back to bed with Nietzsche, and I do that in this paper because 
between the folds of waking thought and dreaming, Nietzsche went into that space in, in beautiful ways and offers an interesting place to examine where complex unity is, can be at home in the questions as they are lived amidst great tragedy, amidst great moral ill, and, and, and amidst even madness. That is our world today. Argue with me if you, you know. I'm a little depressed about it. Um, Gilles Deleuze says that it, it is well that one takes a step for life, a step for thought. Modes of life inspire ways of thinking. Modes of thinking create ways of living. Life activates thought, and thought in turn affirms life. This is the gift that Nietzsche gave of aphorism and poetry, um, and the peculiar so uh, solitude, sensuality, and very unwise ends of the perilous existence that lie beneath this mask. So this is the leaping point, and you know, Deleuze talks about it being the witch's broom, you know, here we go. But um, how am I doing on time? I've got 13 minutes to go. I've got seven minutes left. Great, okay. Um, so here we go. So um, uh, I wish I had the image of Anselm Furbach's um, painting of Alcibiades kind of leaving the party drunk, who's in love with Socrates, right? But he come, he's coming back to the party, and he's kind of, Agathon has kind of made him jealous because he also is a lover, and uh, Alcibiades comes back. Alcibiades in, in this regard and in this paper and in this kind of um, dialogue is the incarnation of love. And he returns to the party, he returns to the, to the situation, to tragedy, um, surrounded by music. Music definitely attends, acts as a passageway to the new, the not yet made future. Alcibiades, wounded lover, hungry ghost, love as intermediary, neither a god nor a mortal, neither rich or poor, assuming the middle spot between knowledge and ignorance among the fuzzy subsets. So love as parasite runs directly to Agathon, the host. Things become undone. He's between knowing what to do, where to go, even who he is, subliminal. And if he is between, he is love, coming from the threshold and from the door, between two winds, fuzzy-minded, ignorant and knowledgeable, yada, yada. Beyond noise, through noise, and into the order of, of discourse. Because there is a triangle going on between the three, and because there is always a, a way of taking energy and removing it and putting it to another host, the, I'm interested in talking about the excluded and included third, and that's what this moment is. And Nietzsche invites us into this third space. The question is no longer that of love, but rather something more general. Uh, who, who are you? What are you doing here? And this space is where, uh, as Whitehead understood it, the harbinger of novelty, creative advance, and infinite processuality of becoming um, occurs. Roland Faber assists, uh, insists also that to hinder the closure of the gap of that mystery between the excluded and included, to, to, to close that gap, um, you, you, you actually to hinder the closure of the gap that the mystery of the infinite opens up a space in which we can meditate on and hopefully create and recreate a purposeful future that does less harm. I mean, it's kind of, it's not that simple, but that's hopefully, it's hopefully that simple. Parasite holds a special place in this discussion because it models the fu fluid passage in the notion of the excluded middle of binary logic, who or that is no longer willing to remain excluded. So aided by the fact that the excluded third, uh, la tierre exclu, the, the third person excluded, is a linguistic instance favoring a numerical metaphor. Sears analyzes it from the perspective of parasitic operator whose intrusive activities set the stage for multiple objects of investigation. It was also Deleuze that wrote that with Leibniz, the question surges forth in philosophy that will continue to haunt both Whitehead and Bergson. Faber, Faber talks about this in um, Rhizomatic um, Connections, having to do with not how to attain eternity, but in what conditions does the objective world allow for a subjective production of novelty, that is, of creation. I hop through because this is too long, and I sent Dr. Keller way too long of a paper, but... Um, <laughs> 
You've got two minutes. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I'm just scrolling down to the, front, <laughs> to the conclusion. <laughs> so the aim of expression is distributed through omnis and unum, uh, one to one, one to multiple, multiple to one, multiple to multiple. There is a parasitic connection always already going on in systems, relational systems. And that's what we were talking about in a Whiteheadian sense. It's all um, relational. And I'm fascinated by the ways that philosophy of organism is based upon a process relational ontology for natural science that replaces a very severely defunct um, ontology. Also the under understanding of time and space. I suppose that if I wanted to end somewhere, I would say that you know, I would probably end with Nietzsche. Um, Deleuze gives a lot of consideration to this in lieu of Nietzsche's de definition of the eternal return and the complete metamorphosis, the irreducibly unequal, depth, distance, caves, the lower depths, the tortuous, the unequal in itself from the only landscape of the eternal return. Nature resides in chaos. I remember that from Dr. Keller's uh, Face of the Deep. And, um, I'm just gonna kind of stop there because we could go on, but here we are. I think I'm done for now. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. So uh, now I'm actually embarrassingly proud, since I have a certain mentor <laughs> relationship here, to be able to introduce Dr. O'Neill Van Horn, who is teaching professor at, of theology at Xavier University in Cincinnati, and is currently a Louisville scholar. O'Neill holds a PhD in philosophical and theological studies from Drew University and specializes in the intersections between constructive theology, critical theory, and environmental justice. He has published various articles and book chapters in the fields of theopoetics, constructive ecotheology, and environmental philosophy. O'Neill's forthcoming book, On the Ground, Terrestrial Theopoetics and Planetary Politics for the Anthropocene, is going to be published by Ford and Press in 2023. That's coming soon. <laughs> Welcome, O'Neill. I'm going to be talking about precarity today, so it makes sense that this situation here is a little bit precarious with my laptop. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it's, it's really good to be with you. Thank you so much to the organizers. Thank you to Claremont UCC um, for having us and for being hospitable hosts. I hope that we're not too much of a, a parasite here in this space. Uh, the, the title <laughs> of this paper is The Vibrancy of Darkness. At least that's it without the subtitle. The, the Vibrancy of Darkness. Vibrancy by which we mean often energy, capacity, agency, saturation, boldness, strength, richness, fullness, maybe even by extension, shalom. The vibrant is often understood as the fluorescent, the bright, the light. But at what cost? What of darkness, of vibrant darkness? Must we cling to what none other than Catherine Keller has called light supremacy, the association of lightness with goodness and thus darkness with badness? Dark days, dark times, the dark side, black sheep, black market, black as sin, and on. And while turns of phrase do not with necessity determine our lived realities, it is, of course, one of the great lessons of post-structuralism that the binary oppositions pervading Western discourse warrant not merely deconstruction, but I think more aptly decomposition. The hues of our hope say something. And they say something, I think, about the collective visions we cast the hues of our hope say something about the composition of that very we. That is, who is included and who is 
excluded or foreclosed or externalized. And while my gratitude for this invitation and, uh, is, is immeasurable and my, the chance to be in conversation with you all is um, one that I feel very grateful for, um, I, I want to invite you to look around. I, I mean that very seriously, to look around. If this conference represents the future of process studies, I do have to wonder about the overwhelming lightness, indeed whiteness, <laughs> of the future of this field. And, and I help not in this regard. I recognize that nevertheless, or, or maybe because of that, I have to repeat that the hues of our hope say something. My question for us to consider today is this. What might the darkening of hope, inspired by the mystical, the muddy, the murky, have to offer? What becomes possible when we shift the hues of our hope? My aim is to theorize an iteration of hope that I'll refer to in various ways as dark hope. That is, I seek a hope sufficiently robust to persist amid the rubble of climate catastrophe. And I submit to you that the, the rift of the unspeakable left in the wake of the divine and the deconstructive and the disastrous yields fecundities for the theorization of a hope that is capable, I think, of resisting the ruinous. Together today, we'll consider questions like, what good is the enigmatic in a moment of unspeakable precarity? Or what is the function of uncertainty in these rather impossible times? Or does the undoing solicited by the unspeakable constitute a vibrant hope amid a precarious present? Or does that undoing leave us to merely unravel? The threads knotting us together, fraying inescapably. There's nothing certain about our future, and there's nothing certain about hope. And by that I mean both, yeah, there's no guarantee that whatever it is that we hope for is gonna happen, but more pointedly, I mean that hope has nothing to do with certainty at all. Hope is not optimism. Optimism is founded on certainty, certain that it's gonna get better, certain that it's gonna work out, whereas hope is planted in uncertainty. Certainty strips us of our responsibility and uncertainty demands it. This is one of the ways that I think the dark of dark hope comes in, as a way to think about hope as uncertain, as a way making in the dark. And it is only because of uncertainty that any need for hope exists in the first place. And while this isn't a glorification of precarity or vulnerability, it is an admission that they inescapably prefigure our existence, an inheritance of the past into the present by way of a grounding openness. The grounded surging of past into present is the admission of a precarious porosity as that which conditions or as that which grounds. And in taking these matters seriously, we inch ever closer, I think, to the edge of an inarticulable mystery, both ontologically and ecologically. The vulnerabilities that threaten our unraveling are the very phenomena that constitute possibility itself. Agrarian Wendell Berry relatedly reflects, quote, the most dangerous tendency in modern society is not only in the totalitarian desire for absolute control. It lies in the willingness to ignore an essential paradox. The natural forces that so threaten us are the same forces that preserve and renew us, end quote. And this supposed threat can lead us down a wide path of seeking control or seeking to dominate. Hence, political theorist William Connolly's unfortunately apt reflections on the intimate connections between climate crisis and fascist resurgence. But if hope is not certainty, but is instead that which emerges from the rift of this paradox of precarity, then might it be the case that hope opens new possibilities by sensitively attuning us to the terrestrial. There is a certain processual porosity that grounds us. And I know that this is nothing new to scholars of process thought, but allow me to clarify and to expand. When I refer to the processual as that which grounds, I, I mean it not strictly as a metaphor, but as some have called it, a matter for. <laughs> that which grounds us, that is the earth ground, is nothing less than ongoing, open-ended on the way. There is no better illustration of process thought that I'm aware of, frankly, than the muddied milieu of soil. Another aspect of the dark of dark hope is thus an effort to open further semiotic registers that bolster the associations of darkness with richness, fullness, power, and vibrancy, exemplified in the dark organic hues of soil, which truly is, maybe we'll disagree, our ground of being, at least on this planet. While certainly substantial, soil shirks any possible designation of substance. Soil decomposes any imposed metaphysics of presence as there is no such thing as soil, and I'm not denying its existence, obviously, but am instead rejecting its calcification as substance, which is but a fabricated ideology that erodes our futures as it lines the pockets of neoliberal agribusinesses and their 
multiplicitous subsidiaries. Soil is not simply dirt, not merely a discrete object, not solely a singular substance, but is a rhizomatic assemblage of matters, minerals, microbes, water, air, heat, energy, and so on. And soil is not universally enabling either. Its fertility is contextually bound. Fertile conditions for one species can easily spell death for another. The processional nature of soil demands bioregional ethics, minding the relations of the eco-social. Just as soil is not one thing or a universalizable thing, neither are just relations to the earth ground. Soil care cannot concretize into norms, cannot universalize into categorical imperatives, at least if one wishes to be faithful to tending to our ground. Generalized approaches to soil care, much, much like most generalities, constitute a form of violence, for the general can only come at the expense of nuance, of particularity, of contextuality, and so on. Soil exists by virtue of larger ecosystemic conditions, it can, a consequence of webs of relation that are neither linear nor straight. And in this way, soil serves as a microcosmic reflection of our macrocosmic terrestrial conditions. Earth cannot and should not be understood as a system of straight causes and effects or tidy, uncomplicated and mappable forces. And despite what neoliberal economists might think, Earth is not stably patterned, nor a steady context, nor a standing reserve, sorry, nor a set of static natural resources. To the contrary, Earth is composed of heterogeneous relations that overlap and crisscross, deaden, catalyze, amplify, and so on. There's nothing linear about Earth, save hegemonic impositions upon it, whether of worldviews or of border walls. The more accurate and compelling alternative, I think, is to tune into what William Connolly calls the bumpy temporalities composing Earth. Earth in this view is multiplicitous, heterogeneous, complicated, nonlinear, indeed queer. So what might this have to do with hope? I would argue that if we wish for our notion of hope to legitimately attune to the nonlinearities of the planetary, meaning the cycles of ecosystems or the fractal emergence of creative life, and if we wish to avoid an anthropocentric hope to whatever extent that's even possible, it would seem that a rejection of the linear, indeed the straight, is quite a wise biomimetic or to play with words a geomimetic thing to do. Any hope of and for the planetary must ebb and flow in concert with it. And we only have to look around to see that it's quite obvious that there's not really any terrestrial precedent for the unwavering straightness that particularly Western and predominantly Christian narratives have so forcibly, for lack of a better term, erected. It would seem that it is optimism, not hope, that holds unwaveringly in all its certainty to the unbending narratives parroted by our present systems. Narratives like develop, innovate, produce, automate, vote. And so any opaque hope, I think, would necessarily resist, deconstruct, if not destroy, that which reinforces these logics, whether of neoliberalism or frankly, vanilla liberal politics that fail to account for systemic injustices like, say, gerrymandering. Thus, the hope I'm proposing and the politics it provokes must not, and I hope you hear this, be understood as incremental progress. Process need not mean progress. I mean, to be blunt, isn't it the notion of progress that has led us to the brink of eco-catastrophe anyways? Pointedly, as soon as we ask the question, who gets to define progress, that the fallacy of progress and its inherent whiteness, I might add, is exposed. Thus, there's nothing, in other words, that's reformist about hope. Hope has nothing to do with order, and far less with law and order, given the ways in which the so-called order veils the reality of the orderly as inherently violent. How does this notion of a nonlinear dark hope then help us reimagine what it means to make decisions in these impossible times? I think, for better or worse, Derrida offers us a bit of a clue here. Derrida's philosophy of the decision can be preliminarily described like this. He says, a true decision is always apparatic, or in a word, paradoxical, in that it can never be calculated or subject to programmatic dictation. Philosopher of religion, Mary Jane Rubinstein, I think compellingly summarizes this aporia. She says, quote, a decidable decision is not a decision, but just a formula or program. For a decision to be itself, it must be undecidable. Otherwise, it is mere calculation, end quote. Notice here the resonance with my own proposition that uncertainty is that which grounds hope. And since with ongoing droughts, ravaging superstorms, and complicating climate patterns are now part of our present and probably future, few decisions as to what it means to live well will be easily decidable. Does this mean that we're just left to apathy in the face of impossibility? And I want to argue no, far from it. Derrida is clear. He says, quote, the aporia is not a paralyzing structure, end quote. 
It is undecidability that allows decisions to be made in the first place, and undecidability is the antonym of indecision. Derrida insists that a genuine decision is necessary and therefore or urgent. He argues, quote, justice, however unrepresentable it remains, does not wait. It is that which must not wait, end quote. And yet if thinking cannot determine what the outcome of a genuine decision will be, as that would amount to mere calculation, which is contrary to a decision, the only possible response, I think, may be the welcoming of the unknowable, the mysterious, the surprising, the stranger. Rubenstein argues too beautifully to be paraphrased. It, it's circuitous, but, but stick with me here. She says this, quote, thinking must find a way not to know its way, to put itself in a position where it cannot know where it is going. The course of thinking must itself become undecidable, learning to welcome what it cannot determine or decide ahead of time, which means it must learn to welcome what it will not know how to welcome, to prepare for the arrival of that whose arrival it cannot prepare. End quote. Good God, what does this mean? Uh, in the rhetoric of this presentation or the di diction of this presentation and to simplify some of these turns of phrase, I think rather simply the undecidable times of the Anthropocene and its rapidly changing climate demand a notion of hope that can only ever be open-ended in process and on the way. Hope is neither a program nor a plan and it must not be a notion of change that reifies the logics of our present. I take very seriously the arguments of the Red Nation an indigenous environmental justice collective who contend, quote, that which created this crisis cannot solve it, end quote. Hope, therefore, to use some theological language, must remain in a cloud of unknowing. Hope as resolute hospitality to the unknown, in short. We would do well to hear the various resonances, I think, between undecidability and the traditions of mystical or apophatic or sometimes called negative theologies. Apophatic theology, you may know, intends to convey the ineffable or unspeakable or infinite precisely by unsaying it. An example here in the Christian tradition would be something like Augustine arguing, if you have understood, that which you have understood is not God. And I submit that the unknowing cloud into which one enters when undone by the mystical, when undone by the muddy, could yet give rise to a terrestrial hope. Apophasis performs a necessary deconstructive function fissuring transcendent universals that pretend eternality. To enter into right relation with soil is to be open to it or to be undone by it. The mysterious abounds, think about it. Soil connects but is contextual, links widely but is ever local, ever, ever located. Soil has depth but is also a surface. It animates but it's not exactly alive. It's porous but it offers footing. Soil is nothing less than aporia. But I must be clear, the inexpressible, whether of soil or the divine, draws us not up and away, but instead into deeper, compassionate care. For example, as historian of mysticism Charles Stang eloquently writes, quote, Eros is the engine of apophasis, a yearning that stretches language to the point that it breaks, stretches the lover to the point that he splits, end quote. This undoing, that is, constitutes an opening not for some transcendent ecstasy, but for more intimate relations, for closer forms of knowing. Unknowability and indeterminacy are not incompatible with hopeful compassion. They are the very catalysts thereof. And so out of the flows of this unnameable undoing comes an eros-driven commitment to the eco, I think. So what then does apophasis explicitly offer to this present theorization of hope and thus to hopeful bioregional ethics? For one, this practice discloses the deconstructive value of becoming undone as an embodiment of radical presence, fracturing any possible solution that purports universality. Bioregions, soil, and their attendant paradoxes undermine, indeed, decompose any panacea. There is no panacea to the planetary, even as our particular planetary conditions intersect vitally, albeit differentially. Darkly hopeful bioregional ethics cannot therefore be predicated on closure of finalities uh, so much as sustained presence. This presence sprouts forth from the revelation disclosed by soil understood through the lens of process. That revelation being the relation of difference or the non-separability of difference. That is, the speechlessness that accompanies an encounter with the unfathomable complexity of our environs, intersecting, overlapping, multiplying, intimates the revelation of the entanglement of each and each and all in all, all the while preserving the critical differences therein. 
An unknowing dark hope breaks open foreclosures and ungrounds our certainties without alighting the need for resolute commitments to justice. This waymaking presence would lead to powerful forms of relation that are not marked by power as power over so much as an honoring of the indeterminacy and unknowability of the complexities of our oikos, of our home. This does not imply the refusal to act, much less to restore or salvage or remediate, but it does demand the processual curling back or folding or reassessment or reattunement. Thus, this unknowing dark hope catalyzes, not suppresses, resolute decision. It's because of this undoing that our efforts towards environmental justice may multiply or may intensify with each folding. To unsay doesn't mean to take back, per se, but to return to the problems for a renewed assessment of their appearances, conditions, trajectories, and so on. Without unknowing, we risk clinging to optimistic closures that may leave us inhospitable to present needs and pressing cries. Mm -hmm. To clarify, the, the central concerns mobilizing these concluding reflections hinges on my fear, warranted or not, that our environmental solutions may be too optimistically rigid to prove effective in the case of the surprising, the unexpected, the unforeseen. What I seek with you is a notion of hope that would compel grounded responses that are fluid and not fixed, flexible and not linear, requiring improvisation, elasticity, inventiveness. What would a symbolic vision of this hope look like? At risk of oversimplifying things, really at risk of oversimplifying things, I would offer to you by way of closing the darkly hopeful event of sowing seeds. Here I mean seed sowing in both the literal and metaphoric sense. Sowing as a prayerful activity that isn't linear progress or anything like that, even as it cultivates the possibility of flourishing. The process of sowing seeds isn't linear, unilateral, unidirectional, or certain. It's oblique, multiplex, rhizomatic, uncertain, yet thoroughly committed. We can think of sowing seeds to draw on black feminist cultural theorist Tina Camp as, quote, that which will have had to happen. In other words, a performance of a future that hasn't happened yet, but must, end quote. In agricultural settings, yes, there's plenty of math involved in calculating quantities of seed necessary to accurately sow a particular crop at a particular spacing in a particular bed for a particular amount of row feet. And yet, all of this becomes ruptured in the event of seeding itself. All programmatic calculation is deconstructed by the unanticipatable variables of rainfall, rainfall or soil composition, heat waves, critter encounters, and beyond. Seeding is thus a relinquishing of all programmatic computation to a position of humility to earth or of unknowing hospitality to what may come. And this hospitality comes only by way of sustained presence. Hope is not otherworldly. It's not an object. It's not personal. It's not linear progress. It's not closure, nor is it certainty. And if you hear nothing else by God, it is not optimism. Hope in this dark and earthy sketch is processual, open-ended, bioregional, collective, indeterminate, and active. Hope is not something to be had, so much as made. And we make it in our troublemaking resistance. There's nothing certain about any hopeful act, including sowing. The work has only just begun to unfold, likely for a lifetime. And here I, I want to resist this closure too by naming that this presentation today is neither some final knowledge nor conclusory answer. How could it be? If nothing else, this presentation is a parable. The point of parables is that they resist oneness and finality and certainty. They remain open-ended and their meaning is not found on the page. Their meaning and wisdom can only be found through communal conversation and a conversation that I look forward to sharing with you now. Thank you. So we've received a lot of rich, dense gifts, <laughs> amazingly uh, crystallized for our conversation. I think at this point, what I'll do is ask uh, a question to each of these panelists. We'll go one by one, uh, and then we'll have time to open up for your questions. So, Dr. Livingston. <laughs> To be is to happen. I just want that to keep echoing <laughs> through all of our thoughts, especially when we uh, go ontological. So thank you for this dynamic investigation of being, a notion so burdened with ontotheological stasis as to 
routinely sabotage its own dynamism. And your thinking with Heidegger does offer an intriguing challenge to us. You make clear Heidegger is key to the opening up of the question of being itself. He was almost the first. Uh, my philosophical brother says, Kassir and Natorp precede him on the question of being. So, of course, we want to hear how you will bring Heideggerian being into dynamic interaction with Whitehead's ontology, and you gave us some cool hints. Certainly no identification uh, of, of God with being will work. But does creativity play the role for Whitehead that being plays for Heidegger, perchance? Creativity, after all, is the category of the ultimate, not God. Does the Whiteheadian focus on becoming, however, becoming rather than being destabilize or thwart or just really complicate any such comparison? Uh, so, you know, the role you lift up of Aragnus event in Heidegger is key, being as event undoes any frozen stasis of being. Uh, so I'm asking, how does this eventiveness then link up to Whitehead's very eventive actual occasions uh, in relation to this, this question of being uh, in comparison to creativity? All right, so I do... I, I do. I spent quite a bit of time actually on this in the later part of the dissertation, and I've spent even more time since the dissertation in a couple of papers and a couple of presentations comparing Whitehead and Heidegger. And my comparison is between Aragonus and creativity. Aragonus and creativity, yeah. not being in creativity. Yeah, not being in creativity. Because yeah. uh, one of the things that I had to drop for the sake of time from my paper was just to mention that in the later Heidegger, when he turns to the question of being and to think about it, as I suggest, in novel ways, one of the words that becomes central for him, and there's a date for this, it's 1936, when he composes a really sort of enigmatic, strange, it's hard to know what the contributions, contributions to philosophy is, um, but it's unusual. But the central word that um, he latches onto in the later part of his career is Ereignis. And Aragnus is, I don't know German. I learned it enough to take a test during my, during my, math, my, my work in my grad studies. Um, but my understanding is that in everyday German, it's just the word for event in the way that in everyday English, event has a very different meaning than we often use it in these contexts. But for Heidegger, it becomes a kind of technical term. And I spent a long time in the later part of my dissertation spelling out Heidegger's initial explorations with the term. Later, after my dissertation, I then try and put Heidegger into a conversation with Whitehead, uh, comparing the way that the two use, um, the way that Whitehead uses creativity and Heidegger uses Aragnus. I see them as doing what Plato was trying to do in the Timaeus. Plato realizes at a certain point in the Timaeus <laughs> that he needs a third. He needs something in addition to being and becoming, you know, that which is and that which is always on the way. And he latches on or identifies this thing called Korah. And I, that, that's where I link up sort of Heidegger and um, uh, Whitehead. I see them both as choreographical thinkers. That's my <laughs> word for it, choreographical thinkers. And by that, each one needs a third to complete their thinking. For Heidegger, it's creativity. For, uh, sorry, for Heidegger, it's uh, Aragnes. For Whitehead, it's creativity. And in this third way, this identification of a third to complete this, um, both of them are trying to think about, you know, in, an, an evental kind of ontology. So that's my really sh too short summary of, of what you're asking about. No, it's rich, it's intriguing. I just keep wanting to think of Aragnus as, as more comparable with actual occasion in, in terms of the event and creativity as something more choric, yeah. Yeah. more like the, the flow, the space in which that yeah. event happens. But yeah. cool, we'll just keep communicating and I, well, yeah, beautiful. Okay, um, and I, 
<laughs> I get to move right along here and, uh, and ask uh, Ruth with her parasite in bed <laughs> a question. Uh, so Ruth, the parasite is a striking image, especially when you bring it into bed. Yeah. <laughs> it's no mere bed bug. <laughs> <laughs> and so with, with Serre, you read the parasite not as mere pest, but as pestering for a needed social change. Yes. So it's seen as sucking resources properly belonging to others. It's conventionally seen that way, but in your reading it exposes the hoax of the humanist capitalist individualism that renders interdependence itself as a kind of parasitism. Mm -hmm. So you work with the para parasite as uh, le hôte, both guest and host, uh, and that challenges the substance you're showing of our civilization's economy. Indeed, perhaps it interrupts it <laughs> in the sense, the third sense. So the parasite is on the one hand the guest dependent upon the host, but it's also, as I hear you, the embodiment of the, the open. And so in that sense, it's the host itself. Mm -hmm. The super host. <laughs> With your reading of Faber, the open itself appears as sheer multiplicity. Or is it the space of that multiplicity? Another Cora question. <laughs> In Whiteheadian lingo, is the open, the creativity itself, the dynamic ground again? <laughs> ground or ungrund? of all openings, spatial and temporal, perhaps? I found that love lends a surprisingly theological conclusion to your reflections. Uh, with Faber, love forms, in his words, the pattern of a universe in which one experiences an aesthetic that is mm -hmm. valuating imminence of God in the world. Mm -hmm. So is it love that invites the parasite into bed? <laughs> love yeah. as host, but then true to its parasitism, is love also guest? So God as host and hosted then? Mm -hmm. Any coordination with Whitehead's two uh, natures of God? Uh, mm -hmm. The primordial nature invites with the lure like a host, but isn't the co consequent nature of God the ultimate host, you know, all receptive? Mm -hmm. But if the lure is received, is God hosted by the actual occasion? Mm -hmm. And is God too imagined as parasite? in some cosmic sense, feeding on the multiplicities of the cosmos, the multiplicities that the same God does host? Mm -hmm. Oui. <laughs> Merci. Yes. Yeah. Si. Como no? Por supuesto, si. Uh, yeah. Yes to those questions because yes is the, yes is the loosing, uh, se désir, the, Yes is the, the loosening of these meanings that have to be loose in order <laughs> to entertain each other. Mm -hmm. I mean that performatively, I mean it uh, biologically, right? The host, like blood sucking kind of idea, but I'm not going that vampy with it. I'm just, um, I think that really, there has to be a noise in order for there to be a cut off of what discourse, which direction these discourses go. There has to be noise that stops the discourse and redirects the order of it. Mm -hmm. And that's the place and time we are in, I believe, as a species of, we know there is a noise. Animals, it, other species know there is noise. Something is not right with the world or the worlds or the multiverse, et cetera. So, how we are choosing to go into those depths and those questions exactly are all in the, in my perspective, the yes to those, to all of those considerations because they aren't in the end separate. Um, and I thought that uh, he did a wonderful job really clarifying that more in a grounded way. So I, yeah. <laughs> Deeply grounded. Pass it along. <laughs> yes, I'm glad the ground is. Yeah, the ground is still here. It's <laughs> proving so yeah. rhythmically firm. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah, thank you, Ruth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, beautiful. Okay, O'Neill, the vibrancy of darkness.
So, to find hope in the dark, you begin with a, <laughs> with a shift from mere deconstruction to decomposition, a, de a decomposing, uh, much more honest about our bottomlessly earthy and mortal entanglements. And you say of our precarious porosity that both ontologically and ecologically, the vulnerabilities that threaten our undoing are the very phenomena that constitute possibility itself. And as I hear you, that possibility as the chance of a just and sustaining future of our Earth life will require ever more difficult decisions. And you don't want us to confuse Derrida's attunement to the aporia of decision, his undecidability. You don't want that confused with paralyzing indecision in the face of possibly impossible possibilities. So you're offering the precarity of our earthy condition as a ground of a dark hope. And so with the needed decisions ecologically, economically, socially for a well-soiled future, a vibrant life together, a life only livable on the dark soil in its reverberation with other darknesses, darknesses racial, mystical, metaphorical. So question, I, I hear the vibrancy of darkness resonating in your work with the vibrational character of the cosmos for Whitehead. Though of course cosmos itself does mean order, so order can't be completely <laughs> undone here, but can be transformed altogether. But you are focusing on our terrestrial bit of cosmos, of cosmic ecology. Your sense of grounding in the earth certainly dirties up any neat, any neat version of metaphysical ground. So can, can you reflect a bit on how this ground of yours then relates to Whitehead's not overly neat sense of ground as creativity? <laughs> a common theme here. The many becoming one and increasing by one and requiring new decisions of every creature that is <laughs> the increase. And of course, uh, a creativity which would constantly thwart any static or deceptively stable sense of ground as foundation, as changeless being. So this relates to the, uh, to the eventiveness of being. Um, now, I want to ask you, oh, I'll wait more time to get into some apophasis later. This is enough, good. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. Um, that's a rich question, and I appreciate it. Um, I, I think you, you sort of hinted at um, how I'm thinking about ground in relation to Whitehead, and, and, and it's a move that I um, make in the first chapter of my forthcoming book. This isn't a sales pitch, but I, I do it in the book, which is to say to uh, distinguish ground from foundation. I think foundation implies a certain flattening, especially of difference. It, it whitewashes difference, as it were. Um, and it, it creates a, a sort of a stability that I don't think exists. Um, and, and it's a stability that I think relies on a metaphysics of presence that I, I, I'm kind of tired of, as, as others are. I'm, I'm sure you relate. Um, and so I think in that way, ground uh, as soil um, is kind of a, a, a metonym in a way. It sort of metonymically materializes what I think Whitehead is doing. Um, and how I'm thinking about hope then is um, what it means to be very mindful of the, uh, the, the, the there, there is no future. And by that I don't mean like hopelessness, but I mean that, that we exist only in the present. And so hope is a form of attunement to creativity um, in a sense. And so those would be some connections that I would draw to Whitehead. Happy to say more and maybe to do it in more orthodoxly Whiteheadian terms, but um, I'll pause for now to, to make space for others. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great start. And just underlining, right, that your distinction of ground from foundation is key. That you're retrieving ground, but then you're not just, uh, you know, subjecting all of your work to the endless deconstruction of foundations. You build that deconstruction in. But the, but one of the ill effects of post-structuralism has been sort of think we can we can be done not just with foundations, but with ground. That's deadly. <laughs> <laughs> 
So your distinction is really key. Okay, we're opening up. Thank you, very, very rich. We have a few minutes for questions, if there are some. Okay, I see you in the back, and then we'll break for lunch. Hi, my name is Missy Greenleaf Flynn. I'm a student at Methodist Theological School in Ohio. And I, this question is for uh, Dr. Van Horn. Um, my research is in an area I call dirty theology. Um, it's about radical incarnation and finding God in the living soil. And I would like to um, commend you for your, your noticing that soil is a perfect matrix for understanding process theology. I think it's also not just a great metaphor, but an actuality. <laughs> It is a place where non-duality plays out constantly in life and death. Things are always dying and always coming into being, and you can experience it in the soil. Um, it also has great ethical consequences <laughs> um, for ecotheology and also how life underground plays out. Um, and I'd, I'd like to hear you say, go a little more deeply, I guess, <laughs> into um, the ideas of non-duality and incarnation as you see them played out in the soil. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. And shout out Mathesca for the great work that they're doing. Um, oh, that's such a rich question, and I appreciate your allusion to... Um, the, the ways in which I think soil illuminates a, 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 a different way of thinking about ethics and politics. Um, I, I think here, especially of, um, oh goodness, I don't know their first names, but Abrahamson and Bertoni's um, Compost Politics or something to that effect. It's an open access article. I'd highly recommend it. Um, in any case, I, I think the way that I'm thinking about ground as soil and soil as ground um, allows us to attend to some of the paradoxes of both climate change, but also things like um, racial politics and racial justice, which is to say, for example, climate change is something that affects us particularly, but it's a planetary phenomenon. It, it's something that's only ever communal and contextual, and yet it's linked. Um, in the same way that I think ground as soil and soil as ground allows us to think about um, meaningful connection and meaningful relationship across difference without uh, eliding those differences, or as I mentioned earlier, and I don't mean it as a pun, I'm, well, I do mean it as a pun, yes, uh, whitewashing those differences. Um, what does it mean to relate across those differences, et cetera? And I think soil in its non-duality um, allows us to um, think more complexly about those paradoxes and um, not smooth them over or, or render them concrete in the form of a foundation, but instead embrace them and um, try and attune ourselves to them. I'm not exactly sure if I'm responding to your question and would love to continue the conversation, but um, I'll pause there for now. Thank you so much. Um, this is also for O'Neill, and it continues um, on this thank you so much. I, I see a lot of resonance with the sacramental eco-theology and food theology that I'm working on, and I want to ask what challenges you see in talking about soil, um, because I, I hear the, the incarnational... Uh, approach of someone like Karen Baker Fletcher who reminds us to think with dust and spirit, right? Reinterpret Chalcedon with dust and spirit. But then I also hear the dust bowl as depletion and, and chaos. Or I also hear blood and soil um, as, as really attentive to our particularity in a, a bad way. So what challenges do you see with this uh, attention to soil? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, and I think, uh, I think yesterday you, you referenced Chris Carter's work, um, Spirit of Soul Food, um, but I think here of his essay, um, Blood in the Soil, the, the racist, uh, racial, and religious dimensions of environmentalism, something like that. Um, so I, I think he names one of those, those difficulties or dangers, which is to say that our relationship to ground, our relationship to land, our relationship to soil is deeply contextual and formed by the traumas of colonialism and chattel slavery and so on. And so um, to, to relate to 
soil and to relate to agricultural work and to food is um, different and differential on account of our histories and, and whatnot. And so I think that's one major challenge. Um, I think to uh, an additional one, and then I'll, I'll pause, is um, the challenge, as you've named, with this idea of blood and soil, um, how do we think meaningfully about ground without rendering it as territory or object? Mm. Uh, what, what does it mean to think about the, the vitality of ground without, um, uh, I guess, capitulating to certain ways of um, wanting to objectify it or to um, render it uh, as owned or uh, belonging in, in, in the worst kinds of ways, if, if that makes sense. Thank you so much for the question. I hope we can continue to be in conversation. You can use Deleuze, his deterritorialization. <laughs> Deterritorialize Earth. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, sorry, it's just uh, more, more of a note, Richard. Uh, I think I, I found it beautiful to relate uh, Eichnis in Heidegger uh, to, to uh, creativity, because I don't know whether you have thought about it, in his last years, he was basically working on Japanese painting and so on, which would neatly say, fit... Say, say that again, he was, he was working on, on Japanese, Japanese painting, you know, Japanese he was painting. interpreting uh, pictures, so... Uh, in that sense, it really nicely fits into your interpretation, uh, eichness to, to creativity. So he really had a shift there, the late, late Heidegger, and it's not, it can't be really compared to actual occasion and so on, which one easily can do because eichness has this all kind of different meanings, of course. Well, I, I, I guess I just want to say that I've been thinking about this connection for a while, and I think you've just given me one final piece to a puzzle I've been wanting to put together in a more formal way, like trying to get published and things like that. No, I wasn't aware, and I think that's really, really interesting. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. And there are probably landscapes, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, friends, let's give them a hand. Thank you very much. Excellent, excellent, guys. All right, we will break for lunch now. Oh, do we Claremont, lunch? Uh, the town, many of options just down the way. We're going to start promptly at 2 o'clock with our next session. To give you a lure, we're going to be talking about, firstly, a whitehead and psychedelic research, something you do not want to miss, I shall assure you. So enjoy lunch. Very, very similar thing. There is there is family connection here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I also... When, cool. Yeah, but deep, it's, 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 it's a difficult metaphor to pull into congruence with ground, isn't it? Yeah. The deep is flowing oceanic water, the ground is earth. Yeah. And so yeah. maybe for that reason, you need them both. That's, that's why I, I like it because what it allows me to do is to show that it's possible to do metaphysics without uh, giving in to the temptation of foundationalism. That's mm -hmm. where I think Heidegger, I, I think his critique is, is good in a lot of ways, but I think what he doesn't seem, at least I don't see him allowing for, is the possibility of a non-foundational metaphysics. And that's where some, I think you're like Ogden, but especially your work yeah. comes in. And I, that's yeah. what I, I draw, draw on it to. Boo. Kind of oh my goodness. Hey, hi. I was just saying hi. Maybe there's some ways to still think about the 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 entities and, and, uh, and, and, and becoming or do metaphysics. Better. In ways that aren't, you know, don't give but in to the same. I find I drove out the same weaknesses. The oh yeah. gosh, so those are still so yeah. We have to make that argument. Like, we, we have to make it in our use Whitehead at all. Yeah. Yeah. She seems to be doing okay. something. Yeah. So I guess we begin with Heidegger, but I really end up with so, so it's you and Whitehead more than any other. Well, I'm tremendously honored to be to be in there as a as a a niece of of Whitehead and a sister to your project. Yeah, yeah. Better than. Does anyone argue that Heidegger is doing this? So we're, we're on the same team. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, um, a lot of people who draw on this work, uh, Derrida yeah. does, and yeah. mm -hmm. uh, even Jean Luc Marion does. does. And, I mean, and always, a lot as, a, of as a critical comment, as a critical always. Comment. Okay. So they're obviously drawing, they're, they're, they're inheritors of the Heideggerian tradition, right? They're really. I haven't been, but they're saying they can't do without. I use the word deconstruction in Heidegger. Heidegger didn't use that word deconstruction. I use it because people are more familiar with it here, but you know, he uses Destruction. Destruction. Right. And in German, you know, destruction is what you would say to say 